Section number 21 of Fairy Tales Every Child Should Know. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by The Story Girl. Fairy Tales Every Child Should Know. Edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Section number 21. The Sleeping Beauty in the Wood. From the French Tale by Charles Perrault. Once upon a time there was a king and a queen, who grieved sorely that they had no children. When at last the queen gave birth to a daughter, the king was so overjoyed that he gave a great christening feast, the like of which had never before been known. He asked all the fairies in the land—there were seven, all told—to stand godmothers to the little princess, hoping that each might give her a gift and so she should have all imaginable perfections. After the christening, all the company returned to the palace, where a great feast had been spread for the fairy godmothers. Before each was set a magnificent plate, with a gold knife and a gold fork studded with diamonds and rubies. Just as they were seating themselves, however, there entered an old fairy, who had not been invited because more than fifty years ago, she had shut herself up in a tower, and it was supposed that she was either dead or enchanted. The king ordered a cover to be laid for her, but it could not be a massive gold one like the others, for only seven had been ordered made. The old fairy thought herself ill-used and muttered between her teeth. One of the young fairies, overhearing her, and fancying she might work some mischief to the little baby, went and hid herself behind the hangings in the hall, so as to be able to have the last word and undo any harm the old fairy might wish to work. The fairies now began to endow the princess. The youngest, for her gift, decreed that she should be the most beautiful person in the world. The next, that she should have the mind of an angel. The third, that she should be perfectly graceful. The fourth, that she should dance admirably well, the fifth, that she should sing like a nightingale, the sixth, that she should play charmingly upon every musical instrument. The turn of the old fairy had now come, and she declared, while her head shook with malice, that the princess should pierce her hand with a spindle and die of the wound. This dreadful fate threw all the company into tears of dismay, when the young fairy, who had hidden herself, came forward, and said, "'Be of good cheer, king and queen. Your daughter shall not so die. It is true I cannot entirely undo what my elder has done. The princess will pierce her hand with a spindle. But, instead of dying, she will only fall into a deep sleep. The sleep will last a hundred years, and at the end of that time a king's son will come to wake her. The king, in hopes of preventing what the old fairy had foretold, immediately issued an edict by which he forbade all persons in his dominion from spinning or even having spindles in their houses under pain of instant death. Now fifteen years after the princess was born, she was with the king and queen at one of their castles, and as she was running about by herself, she came to a little chamber at the top of a tower and there sat an honest old woman spinning, for she had never heard of the king's edict. "'What are you doing?' asked the princess. "'I am spinning, my fair child,' said the old woman, who did not know her. "'How pretty it is!' exclaimed the princess. "'How do you do it? Give it to me that I may see if I can do it.' She had no sooner taken up the spindle then, being hasty and careless, she pierced her hand with the point of it, and fainted away. The old woman, in great alarm, called for help. People came running in from all sides. They threw water in the princess's face, and did all they could to restore her. But nothing would bring her to. The king, who had heard the noise and confusion, came up also, and remembering what the fairy had said, he had the princess carried to the finest apartment and laid upon a richly embroidered bed. 
she lay there and all her loveliness, for the swoon had not made her pale. Her lips were cherry ripe and her cheeks ruddy and fair. Her eyes were closed, but they could hear her breathing quietly. She could not be dead. The king looked sorrowfully upon her. He knew that she would not awake for a hundred years. The good fairy who had saved her life and turned her death into sleep was in the kingdom of Metaquin, twelve thousand leagues away when this happened. But she learned of it from a dwarf who had a pair of seven-league boots, and instantly set out for the castle, where she arrived in an hour, drawn by dragons in a fiery chariot. The king came forward to receive her and showed his grief. The good fairy was very wise, and saw that the princess, when she woke, would find herself all alone in that great castle, and everything about her would be strange. So this is what she did. She touched with her wand everybody that was in the castle, except the king and queen. She touched the governesses, maids of honor, women of the bedchamber, gentlemen, officers, stewards, cooks, scullions, boys, guards, porters, pages, footmen. She touched the horses in the stable with their grooms, the great mastiffs in the courtyard, and even little Poost, the tiny lapdog of the princess that was on the bed beside her. As soon as she had touched them, they all fell asleep, not to wake again until the time arrived for their mistress to do so, when they would be ready to wait upon her. Even the spits before the fire, laden with partridges and pheasants, went to sleep, and the fire itself went to sleep also. It was the work of a moment. The king and queen kissed their daughter farewell, and left the castle issuing a proclamation that no person whatsoever was to approach it. That was needless, for in a quarter of an hour there had grown up about it a wood so thick and filled with thorns that nothing could get at the castle, and the castle-top itself could only be seen from a great distance. A hundred years went by, and the kingdom was in the hands of another royal family. The son of the king was hunting one day, when he discovered the towers of the castle above the tops of the trees, and asked what castle that was. All manner of answers were given to him. One said it was an enchanted castle, another that witches lived there. But most believed that it was occupied by a great ogre, which carried thither all the children he could catch and ate them up one at a time, for nobody could get at him through the wood. The prince did not know what to believe, when finally an old peasant said, Prince, it is more than fifty years since I heard my father say that there was in that castle the most beautiful princess that ever was seen, that she was to sleep for a hundred years, and to be awakened at last by the king's son, who was to marry her. The young prince at these words felt himself on fire, he had not a moment's doubt that he was destined to this great adventure, and full of ardour he determined at once to set out for the castle. Scarcely had he come to the wood, when all the trees and thorns which had made such an impenetrable thicket opened on one side and the other to offer him a path. He walked toward the castle, which appeared now at the end of a long avenue, but when he turned to look for his followers, not one was to be seen. The woods had closed instantly upon him as he had passed through. He was entirely alone, and utter silence was about him. He entered a large forecourt and stood still with amazement and awe. On every side were stretched the bodies of men and animals apparently lifeless. But the faces of the men were rosy, and the goblets by them had a few drops of wine left. The men had plainly fallen asleep. His steps resounded as he passed over the marble pavement and up the marble staircase. He entered the guard-room. There the guards stood drawn up in line with carbines at their shoulders, but they were sound asleep. He passed through one apartment after another, where were ladies and gentlemen asleep in their chairs or standing. He entered a chamber covered with gold and saw on a bed, the curtains of which were drawn, 
the most lovely sight he had ever looked upon. A princess, who appeared to be about fifteen or sixteen, and so fair that she seemed to belong to another world. He drew near, trembling and wondering, and knelt beside her. Her hand lay upon her breast, and he touched his lips to it. At that moment, the enchantment being ended, the princess awoke, and looking drowsily and tenderly at the young man, said, "'Have you come, my prince? I have waited long for you.' The prince was overjoyed at the words, and at the tender voice and look, and scarcely knew how to speak. But he managed to assure her of his love, and they soon forgot all else as they talked and talked. They talked for four hours, and had not then said half that was in their heads to say. Meanwhile all the rest of the people in the castle had been awakened at the same moment as the princess, and they were now extremely hungry. The lady-in-waiting became very impatient, and at length announced to the princess that they all waited for her. Then the prince took the princess by the hand. She was dressed in great splendor but he did not hint that she looked as he had seen pictures of his great-grandmother look. He thought her all the more charming for that. They passed into a hall of mirrors, where they supped, attended by the officers of the princess. The violins and hoboys played old but excellent pieces of music, and after supper, to lose no time, the grand almoner married the royal lovers in the chapel of the castle. When they left the castle the next day to return to the prince's home, they were followed by all the retinue of the princess. They marched down the long avenue, and the wood opened again to let them pass. Outside they met the prince's followers, who were overjoyed to see their master. He turned to show them the castle, but behold, there was no castle to be seen, and no wood. Castle and wood had vanished but the prince and princess went gaily away, and when the old king and queen died, they reigned in their stead. End of section number 21 Recording by The Story Girl Section 22 of Fairy Tales Every Child Should Know This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Packard. Fairy Tales Every Child Should Know. Edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Jack and the Beanstalk. Said to be an allegory of the Teutonic Al Fader. The tale written in French by Charles Perrault. In the days of King Alfred, there lived a poor woman whose cottage was situated in a remote country village, a great many miles from London. She had been a widow some years, and had an only child named Jack, whom she indulged to a fault. The consequence of her blind partiality was that Jack did not pay the least attention to anything she said, but was indolent, careless, and extravagant. His follies were not owing to a bad disposition, but that his mother never checked him. By degrees she disposed of all she possessed. Scarcely anything remained but a cow. The poor woman one day met Jack with tears in her eyes. Her distress was great, for the first time in her life she could not help reproaching him, saying, Oh, you wicked child, by your ungrateful course of life you have at last brought me to beggary and ruin. Cruel, cruel boy! I have not money enough to purchase even a bit of bread for another day. Nothing now remains to sell but my poor cow. I am sorry to part with her. It grieves me sadly, but we must not starve. For a few minutes Jack felt a degree of remorse, but it was soon over, and he began teasing his mother to let him sell the cow at the next village, so much that she at last consented. As he was going along, he met a butcher who inquired why he was driving a cow from home. Jack replied, he was going to sell it. The butcher held some curious beans in his hat. They were of various colors, and attracted Jack's attention. 
this did not pass unnoticed by the butcher, who, knowing Jack's easy temper, thought now was the time to take advantage of it, and, determined not to let slip so good an opportunity, asked what was the price of the cow, offering at the same time all the beans in his hat for her. The silly boy could not conceal the pleasure he felt at what he supposed so great an offer. The bargain was struck instantly, and the cow exchanged for a few paltry beans. Jack made the best of his way home, calling aloud to his mother before he reached home, thinking to surprise her. When she saw the beans, and heard Jack's account, her patience quite forsook her. She kicked the beans away in a passion. They flew in all directions. Some were scattered in the garden. Not having anything to eat, they both went supperless to bed. Jack woke early in the morning, and seeing something uncommon from the window of his bedchamber, ran down the stairs into the garden, where he discovered that some of the beans had taken root and sprung up surprisingly. The stalks were of an immense thickness, and had so entwined that they formed a ladder, nearly like a chain in appearance. Looking upward, he could not discern the top. It appeared to be lost in the clouds. He tried it, found it firm, and not to be shaken, he quickly formed the resolution of endeavoring to climb up to the top in order to seek his fortune, and ran to communicate his intention to his mother, not doubting that she would be equally pleased with himself. She declared that he should not go, said it would break her heart if he did, entreated and threatened, but all in vain. Jack set out, and after climbing up some hours, he reached the top of the beanstalk, fatigued and quite exhausted. Looking around, he found himself in a strange country. It appeared to be a desert, quite barren, not a tree, shrub, house, or living creature to be seen. Here and there were scattered fragments of stone, and at unequal distances small heaps of earth were loosely thrown together. Jack seated himself pensively upon a block of stone, and thought of his mother. He reflected with sorrow upon his disobedience in climbing the beanstalk against her will, and concluded that he must die with hunger. However, he walked on, hoping to see a house where he might beg something to eat. Presently a handsome young woman appeared at a distance. As she approached, Jack could not help admiring how beautiful and lively she looked. She was dressed in the most elegant manner, and had a small white wand in her hand, on the top of which was a peacock of pure gold. While Jack was looking with great surprise at the charming female, she came up to him, and with a smile of the most bewitching sweetness, inquired how he came there. Jack related the circumstance of the beanstalk. She asked him if he recollected his father. He replied he did not, and added that there must be some mystery relating to him, because if he asked his mother who his father was, she always burst into tears and appeared violently agitated, nor did she recover herself for some days after. One thing, however, he could not avoid observing upon these occasions which was that she always carefully avoided answering him, and even seemed afraid of speaking, as if there was some secret connected with his father's history, which she must not disclose. The young woman replied, I will reveal the whole story. Your mother must not. But before I begin, I require a solemn promise on your part to do what I command. I am a fairy and if you do not perform exactly what I desire, you will be destroyed. Jack was frightened at her menaces, but promised to fulfill her injunctions exactly, and the fairy thus addressed him. Your father was a rich man, his disposition remarkably benevolent. He was very good to the poor, and constantly relieving them. He made it a rule to never let a day pass without doing good to some person. On one particular day in the week he kept open house, and invited only those who were reduced, 
and had lived well. He always presided himself, and did all in his power to render his guests comfortable. The rich and the great were not invited. The servants were all happy, and greatly attached to their master and mistress. Your father, though only a private gentleman, was as rich as a prince, and he deserved all he possessed, for he only lived to do good. Such a man was known and talked of. A giant lived a great many miles off. This man was altogether as wicked as your father was good. He was in his heart envious, covetous, and cruel. But he had the art of concealing those vices. He was poor and wished to enrich himself at any rate. Hearing your father spoken of, he formed the design of becoming acquainted with him, hoping to ingratiate himself into your father's favor. He removed quickly into your neighborhood, caused to be reported that he was a gentleman who had just lost all he possessed by an earthquake, and found it difficult to escape with his life. His wife was with him. Your father gave credit to this story, and pitied him, gave him handsome apartments in his own house, and caused him and his wife to be treated like visitors of consequence, little imagining that the giant was meditating a horrid return for all his favors. Things went on in this way for some time, the giant becoming daily more impatient to put his plan into execution. At last a favorable opportunity presented itself. Your father's house was at some distance from the seashore, but with a glass the coast could be seen distinctly. The giant was one day using the telescope. The wind was very high. He saw a fleet of ships in distress off the rocks. He hastened to your father, mentioning the circumstance, and eagerly requested that he would send all the servants he could spare to relieve the sufferers. Every one was instantly dispatched, except the porter and your nurse. The giant then joined your father in the study, and appeared to be delighted. He really was so. Your father recommended a favorite book, and was handing it down. The giant took the opportunity and stabbed him. He instantly fell down dead. The giant left the body, found the porter and nurse, and presently dispatched them determined to have no living witnesses of his crimes. You were then only three months old. Your mother had you in her arms in a remote part of the house and was ignorant to what was going on. She went into the study, but how was she shocked on discovering your father a corpse and weltering in his blood? She was stupefied with horror and grief and was motionless. The giant who was seeking her found her in this state, and hastened to serve her and you as he had done her husband. But she fell at his feet, and in a pathetic manner besought him to spare your life and hers. Remorse for a moment seemed to touch the barbarian's heart. He granted your lives, but first he made her take a most solemn oath, never to inform you of who your father was, or to answer any questions concerning him, assuring her that if she did, he would certainly discover her and put both of you to death in the most cruel manner. Your mother took you in her arms and fled as quickly as possible. She was scarcely gone when the giant repented that he had suffered her to escape. He would have pursued her instantly, but he had to provide for his own safety, as it was necessary he should be gone before the servants returned. Having gained your father's confidence, he knew where to find all his treasure. He soon loaded himself and his wife, set the house on fire in several places, and when the servants returned, the house was burned quite down to the ground. Your poor mother, forlorn, abandoned, and forsaken, wandered with you a great many miles from this scene of desolation. Fear added to her haste. She settled in the cottage where you were brought up, and it was entirely owing to her fear of the giant that she never mentioned your father to you. 
I became your father's guardian at his birth. But fairies have laws to which they are subject, as well as mortals. A short time before the giant went to your father's, I transgressed. My punishment was a suspension of power for a limited time, an unfortunate circumstance, as it totally prevented my securing your father. The day in which you met the butcher, as you went to sell your mother's cow, my power was restored. It was I who secretly prompted you to take the beans in exchange for the cow. By my power the beanstalk grew to so great a height and formed a ladder. I need not add that I inspired you with a strong desire to ascend the ladder. The giant lives in this country. You are the person appointed to punish him for all his wickedness. You will have dangers and difficulties to encounter, but you must persevere in avenging the death of your father, or you will not prosper in any of your undertakings, but will always be miserable. As to the giant's possessions, you may seize on all you can, for everything he has is yours, though now you are unjustly deprived of it. One thing I desire, do not let your mother know you are acquainted with your father's history, till you see me again. Go along the direct road. You will soon see the house where your cruel enemy lives. While you do as I order you, I will protect and guard you, but remember, if you dare disobey my commands, a most dreadful punishment awaits you. When the fairy concluded, she disappeared, leaving Jack to pursue his journey. He walked on till after sunset, when, to his great joy, he espied a large mansion. This agreeable sight revived his drooping spirits. He redoubled his speed, and soon reached it. A plain-looking woman was at the door. He accosted her, begging she give him a morsel of bread and a night's lodging. She expressed the greatest surprise at seeing him, and said it was quite uncommon to see a human being near their house, for it was well known that her husband was a large and very powerful giant, and that he would never eat anything but human flesh, if he could possibly get it that he did not think anything of walking fifty miles to procure it, usually being out the whole day for that purpose. This account greatly terrified Jack, but he still hoped to elude the giant, and therefore he again entreated the woman to take him in for one night only, and hide him where she thought proper. The good woman at last suffered herself to be persuaded, for she was of a compassionate and generous disposition and took him into the house. First they entered a fine, large hall, magnificently furnished. They then passed through several spacious rooms, all in the same style of grandeur, but they appeared to be quite forsaken and desolate. A long gallery was next. It was very dark, just light enough to show that, instead of a wall on one side, there was a grating of iron which parted off a dismal dungeon, from whence issued the groans of those poor victims whom the cruel giant reserved in confinement for his own voracious appetite. Poor Jack was half dead with fear, and would have given the world to have been with his mother again, for he now began to fear that he should never see her more, and gave himself up for lost. He even mistrusted the good woman, and thought, that she had led him into the house for no other purpose than to lock him up among the unfortunate people in the dungeon. At the farther end of the gallery there was a spacious kitchen, and a very excellent fire was burning in the grate. The good woman bid Jack sit down, and gave him plenty to eat and drink. Jack, not seeing anything here to make him uncomfortable, soon forgot his fear and was just beginning to enjoy himself when he was aroused by a loud knocking at the street door, which made the whole house shake. The giant's wife ran to secure him in the oven, and then went to let her husband in. Jack heard him accost her in a voice like thunder, saying, Wife, I smell fresh meat. Oh, my dear, replied she, it is nothing but the people in the dungeon. 
the giant appeared to believe her, and walked into the very kitchen where poor Jack was concealed, who shook, trembled, and was more terrified than he had yet been. At last the monster seated himself quietly by the fireside, whilst his wife prepared supper. By degrees Jack recovered himself sufficiently to look at the giant through a small crevice. He was quite astonished to see what an amazing quantity he devoured, and thought he would never be done eating and drinking. When supper was ended, the giant desired his wife to bring him his hen. A very beautiful hen was then brought, and placed on the table before him. Jack's curiosity was very great to see what would happen. He observed that every time the giant said, Lay! The hen laid an egg of solid gold. The giant amused himself a long time with his hen. Meanwhile, his wife went to bed. At length the giant fell asleep by the fireside and snored like a roaring of a cannon. At daybreak, Jack, finding the giant still asleep and not likely to awaken soon, crept softly out of his hiding place, seized the hen, and ran off with her. He met with some difficulty in finding his way out of the house, but at last he reached the road with safety. He easily found the way to the beanstalk, and descended it better and quicker than he expected. His mother was overjoyed to see him. He found her crying bitterly and lamenting his hard fate, for she concluded that he had come to some shocking end through his rashness. Jack was impatient to show his hen and inform his mother how valuable it was. And now, mother, said Jack, I have brought home that which will quickly make us rich, and I hope to make you some amends for the affliction I have caused you through my idleness, extravagance, and folly. The hen produced as many golden eggs as they desired. They sold them, and in a little time they possessed of as much riches as they wanted. For some months Jack and his mother lived very happily together. But he, being very desirous of traveling, recollecting the fairy's commands, and fearing that if he delayed, she would put her threats into execution, longed to climb the beanstalk and pay the giant another visit, in order to carry away some more of his treasures, for during the time that Jack was in the giant's mansion, whilst he lay concealed in the oven, he learned from the conversation that took place between the giant and his wife that he possessed some wonderful curiosities. Jack thought of his journey again and again, but still he could not summon the resolution enough to break it to his mother, being well assured that she would endeavor to prevent his going. However, one day he told her boldly that he must take a journey up the beanstalk. She begged and prayed him not to think of it, and tried with all her power to dissuade him. She told him that the giant's wife would certainly know him again, and that the giant would desire nothing better than to get him into his power, that he might put him to a cruel death in order to be revenged for the loss of his hen. Jack, finding all his arguments were useless, pretended to give up the point, though resolved to go at all events. He had a dress prepared which would disguise him, and something to color his skin, he thought it impossible for any one to recollect him in this dress. In a few mornings after this, he arose very early, changed his complexion, and unperceived by any one, climbed the beanstalk a second time. He was greatly fatigued when he reached the top, and very hungry. Having rested some time at one of the stones, he pursued his journey to the giant's mansion. He reached it late in the evening. The woman was at the door as before. Jack addressed her, at the same time telling her a pitiful tale, and requesting that she would give him some victuals and drink, and also a night's lodging. She told him, what he knew before very well, that her husband being a powerful and cruel giant, and also that she one night admitted a poor, hungry, friendless boy, who was half dead with traveling that the little ungrateful fellow had stolen one of the giant's treasures, 
and ever since that her husband had been worse than before, used her very cruelly, and continually upbraided her for being the cause of his misfortune. Jack was at no loss to discover that he was attending to the account of a story in which he was the principal actor. He did his best to persuade the good woman to admit him, but found it a very hard task. At last she consented, and as she led the way, Jack observed that everything was just as he had found it before. She took him into the kitchen, and after he had done eating and drinking, she hid him in an old lumber closet. The giant returned at the usual time and walked in so heavily that the house was shaken to its foundation. He seated himself by the fire and soon after exclaimed, Wife, I smell fresh meat. The wife replied, It was the crows who had brought a piece of raw meat and left it on the top of the house. Whilst supper was preparing, the giant was very ill-tempered and impatient, frequently lifting up his hand to strike his wife for not being quick enough. She, however, was always so fortunate as to elude the blow. He was also continually upbraiding her with the loss of his wonderful hen. The giant at last, having ended his voracious supper, and eaten till he was quite satisfied, said to his wife, I must have something to amuse me, either my bars of money or my harp. After a great deal of ill humor, and having teased his wife some, he commanded her to bring down his bags of gold and silver. Jack, as before, peeped out of his hiding place, and presently his wife brought two bags into the room. They were of very large size. One was filled with new guineas, and the other with new shillings. They were both placed before the giant, who began reprimanding his poor wife most severely for staying so long. She replied, trembling with fear, that they were so heavy that she could scarcely lift him, and concluded at last that she would never again bring them downstairs, adding that she had nearly fainted owing to their weight. This so exasperated the giant that he raised his hand to strike her. She, however, escaped and went to bed, leaving him to count over his treasure by way of amusement. The giant took his bags, and after turning them over and over to see that they were in the same state as he left them, began to count their contents. First the bag which contained the silver was emptied, and the contents placed upon the table. Jack viewed the glittering heaps with delight, and most heartily wished them in his own possession. The giant, little thinking he was so narrowly watched, reckoned the silver over several times, and then having satisfied himself that all was safe, put it into the bag again, which he made very secure. The other bag was opened next, and the guineas placed on the table. If Jack was pleased at the sight of the silver, how much more delighted he felt when he saw such a heap of glittering gold. He even had the boldness to think of gaming both bags, but suddenly recollecting himself, he began to fear that the giant would sham sleep, the better to entrap anyone who might be concealed. When the giant had counted over the gold till he was tired, he put it up, if possible, more secure than he had put up the silver before. He then fell back on his chair by the fireside and fell asleep. He snored so loud that Jack compared his noise to the roaring of the sea in the high wind when the tide was coming in. At last Jack concluded him to be asleep, and therefore secure, stole out of his hiding place and approached the giant in order to carry off the two bags of money. But just as he laid his hand upon one of the bags, a little dog, whom he had not perceived before, started from under the giant's chair and barked at Jack most furiously, who now gave himself up for lost. Fear riveted him to the spot, 
instead of endeavoring to escape, he stood still, though expecting his enemy to wake every instant. Contrary, however, to this expectation, the giant continued in a sound sleep, and the dog grew very weary of barking. Jack now began to recollect himself, and on looking around, he saw a large piece of meat. This he threw to the dog, who instantly seized it, took it into the lumber closet, which Jack had just left. Finding himself delivered from a noisy and troublesome enemy, and seeing the giant did not awake, Jack boldly seized the bags, and throwing them over his shoulders, ran out of the kitchen. He reached the street door in safety, and found it quite daylight. In his way to the top of the beanstalk, he found himself greatly incommodated by the weight of the money bags, and really they were so heavy that he could scarcely carry them. Jack was overjoyed when he found himself near the beanstalk. He soon reached the bottom, and immediately ran to seek his mother. To his great surprise the cottage was deserted. He ran from one room to another without being able to find anyone. He then hastened into the village, hoping to see some of the neighbors who could inform him where he could find his mother. An old woman at last directed him to a neighboring house, where she was ill of a fever. He was greatly shocked on finding her apparently dying, and could scarcely bear his own reflections on knowing himself to be the cause. On being informed of our hero's safe return, his mother by degrees revived, and gradually recovered. Jack presented her with his two valuable bags. They lived happily and comfortably. The cottage was rebuilt and well furnished. For three years Jack heard no more of the beanstalk, but he could not forget it, though he feared making his mother unhappy. She would not mention the hated beanstalk, lest it should remind him of taking another journey. Notwithstanding the comforts Jack enjoyed at home, his mind dwelled continually upon the beanstalk, for the fairy's menaces, in case of his disobedience, were ever present in his mind, and prevented him from being happy. He could think of nothing else. It was in vain endeavoring to amuse himself. He became thoughtful, and would arise at the first dawn of day, and view the beanstalk for hours together. His mother saw that something preyed heavily upon his mind, and endeavored to discover the cause, but Jack knew too well what the consequence would be, should she succeed. He did his utmost, therefore, to conquer the great desire he had for another journey up the beanstalk. Finding, however, that his inclination grew too powerful for him, he began to make secret preparations for his journey, and on the longest day arose as soon as it was light, ascended the beanstalk, and reached the top with some little trouble. He found the road, journey, etc., much as it was on his two former times. He arrived at the giant's mansion in the evening, and found his wife standing as usual at the door. Jack had disguised himself so completely that she did not appear to have the least recollection of him. However, when he pleaded hunger and poverty in order to gain admittance, he found it very difficult to persuade her. At last he prevailed, and was concealed in the copper. When the giant returned, he said, I smell fresh meat. But Jack felt quite composed, as he had said so before, and had been soon satisfied. However, the giant started up suddenly, and notwithstanding all his wife could say, he searched around the room. Whilst he was going forward, Jack was exceedingly terrified, and ready to die with fear, wishing himself at home a thousand times. But when the giant approached the copper, and put his hand upon the lid, Jack thought his death was certain. The giant ended his search there, without moving the lid, and seated himself quietly by the fireside. This fright nearly overcame poor Jack. He was afraid of moving or even breathing, lest he should be discovered. The giant at last ate a hearty supper. When he had finished, he commanded his wife to fetch down his harp. Jack peeped under the copper lid, and soon saw the most beautiful harp that could be imagined. 
It was placed by the giant on the table, who said, Play! And it instantly played of its own accord, without being touched. The music was uncommonly fine. Jack was delighted, and felt more anxious to get the harp into his possession than either of the former treasures. The giant's soul was not attuned to harmony, and the music soon lulled him into a sound sleep. Now, therefore, it was time to carry off the harp. As the giant appeared to be in a more profound sleep than usual, Jack soon determined. He got out of the copper and seized the harp. The harp was enchanted by a fairy. It called out loudly, Master! Master! The giant awoke, stood up, and tried to pursue Jack. But he had drank so much that he could hardly stand. Poor Jack ran as fast as he could. In a little time the giant recovered sufficiently to walk slowly, or rather to reel after him. Had he been sober, he must have overtaken Jack instantly. But, as he then was, Jack contrived to be the first at the top of the beanstalk. The giant called after him in a voice like thunder, and sometimes was very near him. The moment Jack got down the beanstalk, he called out for a hatchet. One was brought him directly. Just at that instant the giant was beginning to descend. But Jack, with his hatchet, cut the beanstalk, close off at the root, which made the giant fall headlong into the garden. The fall killed him, thereby releasing the world from a barbarous enemy. Jack's mother was delighted when she saw the beanstalk destroyed. At this instant the fairy appeared. She first addressed Jack's mother and explained every circumstance relating to the journeys up the beanstalk. The fairy charged Jack to be dutiful to his mother and to follow his father's good example, which was the only way to be happy. She then disappeared. Jack heartily begged his mother's pardon for all the sorrow and affliction he had caused her, promising most faithfully to be very dutiful and obedient to her for the future. End of section 22. Recording by Michael Packard. Section 23 of Fairy Tales Every Child Should Know. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bob Gonzalez. Fairy Tales Every Child Should Know. Edited by Hamilton Wright Mabby. Section 23. Jack the Giant Killer. From the old British legend told by Geoffrey of Monmouth of Corinius the Trojan. In the reign of the famous King Arthur, there lived near the land's end of England, in the country of Cornwall, a worthy farmer, who had an only son named Jack. Jack was a boy of a bold temper. He took pleasure in hearing or reading stories of wizards, conjurers, giants, and fairies, and used to listen eagerly while his father talked of the great deeds of the brave knights of King Arthur's round table. When Jack was sent to take care of the sheep and oxen in the field, he used to amuse himself with planning battles, sieges, and means to conquer or surprise a foe. He was above the common sports of children, but hardly any one could equal him at wrestling, or if he met with a match for himself in strength. His skill and address always made him the victor. In those days there lived on St. Michael's Mount of Cornwall, which rises out of the sea at some distance from the mainland, a huge giant. He was eighteen feet high, and three yards round, and his fierce and savage looks were the terror of all his neighbors. He dwelt in a gloomy cavern on the very top of the mountain, and used to wade over to the mainland in search of his prey. When he came near, the people left their houses, and after he had glutted his appetite upon their cattle, he would throw half a dozen oxen upon his back, and tie three times as many sheep and hogs round his waist, and so march back to his own abode. The giant had done this for many years, and the coast of Cornwall was greatly hurt by his thefts, when Jack boldly resolved to destroy him. He therefore took a horn, a shovel, pickaxe, and a dark lantern, and early in a long winter's evening he swam to the mount. There he fell to work at once, 
and before morning he had dug a pit twenty-two feet deep and almost as many broad. He covered it over with sticks and straw, and strewed some of the earth over it, to make it look just like solid ground. He then put his horn to his mouth, and blew such a loud and long tantivy that the giant awoke and came towards Jack roaring like thunder. "'You saucy villain! You shall pay dearly for breaking my rest. I will broil you for my breakfast!' He had scarcely spoken these words when he came advancing one step farther, but then he tumbled headlong into the pit, and his fall shook the very mountain. "'Ho, ho, Mr. Giant!' said Jack, looking into the pit. "'Have you found your way so soon to the bottom? "'How is your appetite now? "'Will nothing serve you for breakfast this cold morning but broiling poor Jack?' "'The giant now tried to rise, "'but Jack struck him a blow on the crown of the head with his pickaxe, "'which killed him at once. "'Jack then made haste back to rejoice his friends with the news of the giant's death. "'When the justices of Cornwall heard of this valiant action, "'they sent for Jack,' and declared that he should always be called Jack the Giant Killer, and they also gave him a sword and belt, upon which was written in letters of gold, This is the valiant Cornish man who slew the giant Cormoran. The news of Jack's exploits soon spread over the western parts of England, and another giant, called Old Blunderbore, vowed to have revenge on Jack, if it should ever be his fortune to get him in his power. This giant kept an enchanted castle in the midst of a lonely wood. About four months after the death of Cormoran, as Jack was taking a journey into Wales, he passed through this wood, and as he was very weary he sat down to rest by the side of a pleasant fountain, and there he fell into a deep sleep. The giant came to the fountain for water just at this time, and found Jack there, and as the lines on Jack's belt showed who he was, the giant lifted him up and laid him gently upon his shoulder to carry him to his castle, but as he passed through the thicket the rustling of the leaves waked Jack, and he was sadly afraid when he found himself in the clutches of Blunderbore. Yet this was nothing to his fright soon after, for when they reached the castle he beheld the floor covered all over with the skulls and bones of men and women. The giant took him into a large room where lay the hearts and limbs of persons who had been lately killed and he told Jack with a horrid grin that men's hearts, eaten with pepper and vinegar, were his nicest food, and also that he thought he should make a dainty meal on his heart. When he had said this, he locked Jack up in that room, while he went to fetch another giant who lived in the same wood, to enjoy a dinner off Jack's flesh with him. While he was away, Jack heard dreadful shrieks, groans, and cries from many parts of the castle, and soon after he heard a mournful voice repeat these lines, Haste, valiant stranger, haste away, lest you become the giant's prey. On his return he'll bring another, still more savage than his brother, a horrid, cruel monster who, before he kills, will torture you. O oh, valiant stranger, haste away, or you'll become these giant's prey. This warning was so shocking to poor Jack, that he was ready to go mad. He ran to the window, and saw the two giants coming along, arm in arm. This window was right over the gates of the castle. Now, thought Jack, either my death or freedom is at hand. There were two strong cords in the room. Jack made a large noose with a slipknot at the end of both these, and as the giants were coming through the gates, he threw the ropes over their heads. He then made the other ends fast to a beam in the ceiling, and pulled with all his might till he had almost strangled them. When he saw that they were both quite black in the face, and he had not the least strength left, he drew his sword and slid down the ropes. He then killed the giants, and thus saved himself from the cruel death they meant to put him to. Jack next took a great bunch of keys from the pocket of Blunderbore, and went into the castle again, he made a strict search through all the rooms, and in them found three ladies tied up by the hair of their heads, and almost starved to death. They told him that their husbands had been killed by the giants, who had condemned them to be starved to death, because they would not eat the flesh of their own dead husbands. Ladies, said Jack, 
i have put an end to the monster and his wicked brother and i give you this castle and all the riches it contains to make you some amends for the dreadful pains you have felt he then very politely gave them the keys of the castle and went further on his journeys to wales as jack had not taken any of the giant's riches for himself and so had very little money of his own he thought it best to travel as fast as he could at length he lost his way and when night came on he was in a lonely valley between two lofty mountains where he walked about for some hours without seeing any dwelling-place so he thought himself very lucky at last in finding a large and handsome house he went up to it boldly and knocked loudly at the gate when to his great terror and surprise there came forth a monstrous giant with two heads he spoke to jack very civilly for he was a welsh giant and all the mischief he did was by private and secret malice under the show of friendship and kindness jack told him that he was a traveller who had lost his way on which the huge monster made him welcome and led him into a room where there was a good bed to pass the night in jack took off his clothes quickly but though he was so weary he could not go to sleep soon after this he heard the giant walking backward and forward in the next room and saying to himself though here you lodge with me this night you shall not see the morning light my club shall dash your brains out quite so say you thought jack are these your tricks upon travellers but i hope to prove as cunning as you then getting out of bed he groped about the room and at last found a large thick billet of wood he laid it in his own place in the bed and then hid himself in a dark corner of the room in the middle of the night the giant came with his great club and struck many heavy blows on the bed in the very place where jack had laid the billet and then he went back to his own room thinking he had broken all his bones early in the morning jack put a bold face upon the matter and walked into the giant's room to thank him for his lodgings the giant started when he saw him and he began to stammer out oh dear me is it you pray how did you sleep last night did you hear or see anything in the dead of the night nothing worth speaking of said jack carelessly a rat i believe gave me three or four slaps with his tail and disturbed me a little but i soon went to sleep again the giant wondered more and more at this and yet he did not answer a word but went to bring two great bowls of hasty pudding for their breakfast jack wished to make the giant believe that he could eat as much as himself so he contrived to button a leathern bag inside his coat and slipped the hasty pudding into this bag while he seemed to put it into his mouth when breakfast was over he said to the giant now i will show you a fine trick i can cure all wounds with a touch i could cut off my head one minute and the next put it sound again on my shoulders you shall see an example he then took hold of the knife ripped up the leathern bag and all the hasty pudding tumbled out upon the floor odd splutter her nails cried the welsh giant who was ashamed to be outdone by such a little fellow as jack her can do that herself so he snatched up the knife plunged it into his stomach and in a moment dropped down dead as soon as jack had thus tricked the welsh monster he went farther on his journey and a few days after he met with king arthur's only son who had got his father's leave to travel into wales to deliver a beautiful lady from the power of a wicked magician who held her in his enchantments when jack found that the young prince had no servants with him he begged leave to attend him and the prince at once agreed to this and gave jack many thanks for his kindness the prince was a handsome polite and brave knight and so good-natured that he gave money to everybody he met at length he gave his last penny to an old woman and then turned to jack and said how shall we be able to get food for ourselves the rest of our journey leave that to me sir said jack i will provide for my prince night now came on and the prince began to grow uneasy at thinking where they should lodge sir said jack be of good heart two miles farther there lives a large giant whom i know well he has three heads and will fight five hundred men and make them fly before him alas replied the king's son we had better never have been born than meet with such a monster my lord leave me to manage him and wait here in quiet till i return 
the prince now stayed behind while jack rode on full speed and when he came to the gates of the castle he gave a loud knock the giant with a voice like thunder roared out who is there and jack made answer and said no one but your poor cousin jack well said the giant what news cousin jack dear uncle said jack i have some heavy news pooh said the giant what heavy news can come to me i am a giant with three heads and can fight five hundred men and make them fly before me alas said jack here is the king's son coming with two thousand men to kill you and destroy the castle and all you have oh cousin jack said the giant this is heavy news indeed but i have a large cellar underground and you shall lock and bar me in and keep the keys till the king's son is gone now when jack had made the giant fast in the vault he went back and fetched the prince to the castle they both made themselves merry with wine and other dainties that were in the house so that night they rested very pleasantly while the poor giant lay trembling and shaking with fear in the cellar underground early in the morning jack gave the king's son gold and silver out of the giant's treasure and set him three miles forward on his journey he then went to let his uncle out of the hole who asked jack what he could give him as a reward for saving his castle why good uncle said jack i desire nothing but the old coat and cap with the old rusty sword and slippers which are hanging at your bed's head then said the giant you shall have them and pray keep them for my sake for they are things of great use the coat will keep you invisible the cap will give you knowledge the sword cut through anything and the shoes are of vast swiftness these may be useful to you in all times of danger so take them with all my heart jack gave many thanks to the giant and then set off to the prince when he had come up with the king's son they soon arrived at the dwelling of the beautiful lady who was under the power of a wicked magician she received the prince very politely and made a noble feast for him and when it was ended she rose and wiping her mouth with a fine handkerchief said my lord you must submit to the custom of my palace to-morrow morning i command you to tell me on whom i bestow this handkerchief or lose your head she then went out of the room the young prince went to bed very mournful but jack put on his cap of knowledge which told him that the lady was forced by the power of enchantment to meet the wicked magician every night in the middle of the forest jack now put on his coat of darkness and his shoes of swiftness and was there before her when the lady came she gave the handkerchief to the magician jack with his sword of sharpness at one blow cut off his head the enchantment was then ended in a moment and the lady was restored to her former virtue and goodness she was married to the prince on the next day and soon after went back with her royal husband and a great company to the court of king arthur where they were received with loud and joyful welcomes and the valiant hero jack for the many great exploits he had done for the good of his country was made one of the knights of the round table as jack had been so lucky in all his adventures he resolved not to be idle for the future but still to do what services he could for the honour of the king and the nation he therefore humbly begged his majesty to furnish him with a horse and money that he might travel in search of new and strange exploits for he said to the king there are many giants yet living in the remote parts of wales to the great terror and distress of your majesty's subjects therefore if it please you sire to favour me in my design i will soon rid your kingdom of these giants and monsters in human shape now when the king heard this offer and began to think of the cruel deeds of these bloodthirsty giants and savage monsters he gave jack everything proper for such a journey after this jack took leave of the king the prince and all the knights and set off taking with him his cap of knowledge his sword of sharpness his shoes of swiftness and his invisible coat the better to perform the great exploits that might fall in his way he went along over high hills and lofty mountains and on the third day he came to a large wide forest through which his road led he had hardly entered the forest when on a sudden he heard very dreadful shrieks and cries he forced his way through the trees and saw a monstrous giant dragging along by the hair of their heads a handsome knight and his beautiful lady 
their tears and cries melted the heart of honest jack to pity and compassion he alighted from his horse and tying him to an oak tree he put on his invisible coat under which he carried his sword of sharpness when he came up to the giant he made several strokes at him but could not reach his body on account of the enormous height of the terrible creature but he wounded his thighs in several places and at length putting both hands to his sword and aiming with all his might he cut off both the giant's legs just below the garter and the trunk of his body tumbling to the ground made not only the trees shake but the earth itself tremble with the force of his fall then jack setting his foot upon his neck exclaimed thou barbarous and savage wretch behold i come to execute upon thee the just reward for all thy crimes and instantly plunged his sword into the giant's body the huge monster gave a hideous groan and yielded up his life into the hands of the victorious jack the giant killer whilst the noble knight and the virtuous lady were both joyful spectators of his sudden death and their deliverance the courteous knight and his fair lady not only returned jack hearty thanks for their deliverance but also invited him to their house to refresh himself after his dreadful encounter as likewise to receive a reward for his good services no said jack i cannot be at ease till i find out the den that was the monster's habitation the knight on hearing this grew very sorrowful and replied noble stranger it is too much to run a second hazard this monster lived in a den under yonder mountain with a brother of his more fierce and cruel than himself therefore if you should go thither and perish in the attempt it would be a heart-breaking thing to me and my lady so let me persuade you to go with us and desist from any farther pursuit nay answered jack if there be another even if there were twenty i would shed the last drop of blood in my body before one of them should escape my fury when i have finished this task i will come and pay my respects to you so when they had told him where to find them again he got on his horse and went after the dead giant's brother jack had not rode a mile and a half before he came in sight of the mouth of the cavern and nigh the entrance of it he saw the other giant sitting on a huge block of fine timber with a knotted iron club lying by his side waiting for his brother his eyes looked like flames of fire his face was grim and ugly and his cheeks seemed like two flitches of bacon the bristles of his beard seemed to be thick rods of iron wire and his long locks of hair hung down upon his broad shoulders like curling snakes jack got down from his horse and turned him into a thicket then he put on his coat of darkness and drew a little nearer to behold this figure and said softly o oh, monster are you there it will not be long before i shall take you fast by the beard the giant all this while could not see him by reason of his invisible coat so jack came quite close to him and struck a blow at his head with his sword of sharpness but he missed his aim and only cut off his nose which made him roar like loud claps of thunder and though he rolled his glaring eyes round on every side he could not see who had given him the blow yet he took up his iron club and began to lay about him like one that was mad with pain and fury nay said jack if this be the case i will kill you at once so saying he slipped nimbly behind him and jumping upon the block of timber as the giant rose from it he stabbed him in the back when after a few howls he dropped down dead jack cut off his head and sent it with the head of his brother whom he had killed before in the forest to king arthur by a wagon which he hired for that purpose with an account of all his exploits when jack had thus killed these two monsters he went into their cave in search of their treasure he passed through many turnings and windings which led him to a room paved with freestone at the end of it was a boiling cauldron and on the right hand stood a large table where the giants used to dine he then came to a window that was secured with iron bars through which he saw a number of wretched captives who cried out when they saw jack alas alas young man you are come to be one among us in this horrid den i hope said jack you will not stay here long but pray tell me what is the meaning of your being here at all alas said one poor old man i will tell you sir 
we are persons that have been taken by the giants who hold this cave and are kept till they choose to have a feast then one of us is to be killed and cooked to please their taste it is not long since they took three for the same purpose well said jack i have given them such a dinner that it will be long enough before they have any more the captives were amazed at his words you may believe me said jack for i have killed them both with the edge of the sword and have sent their large heads to the court of king arthur as marks of my great success to show them that what he said was true he unlocked the gate and set them all free then he led them to the great room placed them round the table and set before them two quarters of beef with bread and wine upon which they feasted to their fill when supper was over they searched the giant's coffers and jack shared the store in them among the captives who thanked him for their escape the next morning they set off to their homes and jack to the knight's house whom he had left with his lady not long before it was just at the time of sunrise that jack mounted his horse to proceed on his journey he arrived at the knight's house where he was received with the greatest joy by the thankful knight and his lady who in honour of jack's exploits gave a grand feast to which all the nobles and gentry were invited when the company were assembled the knight declared to them the great actions of jack and gave him as a mark of respect a fine ring on which was engraved the picture of the giant dragging the knight and the lady by the hair with this motto round it behold in dire distress were we under a giant's fierce command but gained our lives and liberty from valiant jack's victorious hand among the guests then present were five aged gentlemen who were fathers to some of those captives who had been freed by jack from the dungeon of the giants as soon as they heard that he was the person who had done such wonders they pressed round him with tears of joy to return him thanks for the happiness he had caused to them after this the bowl went round and every one drank to the health and long life of the gallant hero mirth increased and the hall was filled with peals of laughter and joyful cries but on a sudden a herald pale and breathless with haste and terror rushed into the midst of the company and told them that thundal a savage giant with two heads had heard of the death of his two kinsmen and was coming to take his revenge on jack and that he was now within a mile of the house the people flying before him like chaff before the wind at this news the very boldest of the guests trembled but jack drew his sword and said let him come i have a rod for him also pray ladies and gentlemen do me the favour to walk into the garden and you shall soon behold the giant's defeat and death to this they all agreed and heartily wished him success in his dangerous attempt the knight's house stood in the middle of a moat thirty feet deep and twenty wide over which lay a drawbridge jack set men to work to cut the bridge on both sides almost to the middle and then dressed himself in his coat of darkness and went against the giant with his sword of sharpness as he came close to him though the giant could not see him for his invisible coat yet he found some danger was near which made him cry out fa fi fi fo fum i smell the blood of an englishman let him be alive or let him be dead i'll grind his bones to make me bread say you so my friend said jack you are a monstrous miller indeed art thou cried the giant the villain that killed my kinsman then i will tear thee with my teeth and grind thy bones to powder you must catch me first said jack and throwing off his coat of darkness and putting on his shoes of swiftness he began to run the giant following him like a walking castle making the earth shake at every step jack led him round and round the walls of the house that the company might see the monster and to finish the work jack ran over the drawbridge the giant going after him with his club but when the giant came to the middle where the bridge had been cut on both sides the great weight of his body made it break and he tumbled into the water and rolled about like a large whale jack now stood by the side of the moat and laughed and jeered at him saying i think you told me 
you would grind my bones to powder. When will you begin? The giant foamed at both his horrid mouths with fury, and plunged from side to side of the moat, but he could not get out to have revenge on his little foe. At last Jack ordered a cart-rope to be brought to him. He then drew it over his two heads, and by the help of a team of horses dragged him to the edge of the moat, where he cut off the monster's heads, and before he either eat or drank he sent them both to the court of King Arthur. He then went back to the table with his company, and the rest of the day was spent in mirth and good cheer. After staying with the knight for some time, Jack grew weary of such an idle life, and set out again in search of new adventures. He went over the hills and dales without meeting any, till he came to the foot of a very high mountain. Here he knocked at the door of a small and lonely house, and an old man, with a head as white as snow, let him in. "'Good father,' said Jack, "'can you lodge a traveller who has lost his way?' "'Yes,' said the hermit, "'I can, if you will accept such fare as my poor house affords.' Jack entered, and the old man set before him some bread and fruit for his supper. When Jack had eaten as much as he chose, the hermit said, "'My son, I know you are the famous conqueror of giants. Now on the top of this mountain is an enchanted castle.' kept by a giant named Galligantus, who, by the help of a vile magician, gets many knights into his castle, where he changes them into the shape of beasts. Above all I lament the hard fate of a duke's daughter, whom they seized as she was walking in her father's garden, and brought her hither through the air in a chariot drawn by two fiery dragons, and turned her into the shape of a deer. Many knights have tried to destroy the enchantment and deliver her, yet none have been able to do it, by reason of two fiery griffins who guard the gate of the castle and destroy all who come nigh. But as you, my son, have an invisible coat, you may pass by them without being seen, and on the gates of the castle you will find engraved by what means the enchantment may be broken. Jack promised that in the morning, at the risk of his life, he would break the enchantment, and after a sound sleep he arose early, put on his invisible coat, and got ready for the attempt. When he had climbed to the top of the mountain he saw the two fiery griffins, but he passed between them without the least fear of danger, for they could not see him because of his invisible coat. On the castle gate he found a golden trumpet, under which were written these lines, Whoever can this trumpet blow shall cause the giant's overthrow. As soon as Jack had read this, he seized the trumpet, and blew a shrill blast which made the gates fly open, and the very castle itself tremble. The giant and the conjurer now knew that their wicked course was at an end, and they stood biting their thumbs and shaking with fear. Jack, with his sword of sharpness, soon killed the giant. The magician was then carried away by a whirlwind, and every knight and beautiful lady who had been changed into birds and beasts returned to their proper shapes. The castle vanished away like smoke, and the head of the giant Galligantus was sent to King Arthur. The knights and ladies rested that night at the old man's hermitage, and next day they set out for the court. Jack then went up to the king and gave his majesty an account of all his fierce battles. Jack's fame had spread through the whole country, and at the king's desire the duke gave him his daughter in marriage, to the joy of all the kingdom. After this the king gave him a large estate, on which he and his lady lived the rest of their days, in joy and content. End of section 23 Recording by Bob Gonzalez Section 24 of Fairy Tales Every Child Should Know. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Packard. Fairy Tales Every Child Should Know. Edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Section 24. Little Red Riding Hood. From the French Tale by Charles Perrault. Once upon a time there lived in a village a country girl, 
who was the sweetest little creature that ever was seen. Her mother naturally loved her with excessive fondness, and her grandmother doted on her still more. The good woman had made for her a pretty little red-colored hood, which so much became the little girl that everyone called her Little Red Riding Hood. One day her mother, having made some cheesecakes, said to her, Go, my child, and see how your grandmother does, for I fear she is ill. Carry her some of these cakes and a little pot of butter. Little Red Riding Hood straight set out with a basket filled with the cakes and the pot of butter for her grandmother's house, which was in a village a little way off the town that her mother lived in. As she was crossing a wood which lay in her road, she met a large wolf, which had a great mind to eat her up, but dared not, for fear of some woodcutters who were at work near them in the forest. Yet he spoke to her, and asked her whither she was going. The little girl, who did not know the danger of talking to a wolf, replied, I am going to see my grandmamma, and carry these cakes and a pot of butter. Does she live far off? said the wolf. Oh, yes, answered Little Red Riding Hood. Beyond the mill, you see yonder, at the first house in the village. Well, said the wolf, I will take this way, and you take that, and see which will be there the soonest. The wolf set off at full speed, running as fast as he could, and taking the nearest way, while the little girl took the longest. And as she went along, she began to gather nuts, run after butterflies, and make nosegays with such flowers as she found within her reach. The wolf got to the dwelling of the grandmother first, and knocked at the door. Who is there? said some voice in the house. It is your grandchild, Little Red Riding Hood, said the wolf, speaking like a little girl as well as he could. I have brought you some cheesecakes and a little pot of butter that Mama has sent you. The good old woman, who was ill in bed, called out, Pull the bobbin, and the latch will go up. The wolf pulled the bobbin, and then the door went open. The wolf then jumped upon the poor old grandmother, and ate her up in a moment, for it was three days since he had tasted any food. The wolf then shut the door, and laid himself down in the bed, and waited for Little Red Riding Hood, who very soon after reached the house. Tap, tap! "'Who is there?' cried he. She was at first a little afraid at hearing the gruff voice of the wolf, but she thought that perhaps her grandmother had got a cold, so she answered, "'It is your grandchild, Little Red Riding Hood. Mama has sent you some cheesecakes and a little pot of butter.' The wolf cried out in a softer voice, "'Pull the bobbin and the latch will go up.' Little Red Riding Hood pulled the bobbin, and the door went open. When she came into the room, the wolf hid himself under the bedclothes, and said to her, trying all he could to speak in a feeble voice, "'Put the basket on the stool, my dear, and take off your clothes and come into bed.' Little Red Riding Hood, who always used to do what she was told, straight undressed herself and stepped into bed. But she thought it strange to see how her grandmother looked in the night clothes, so she said to her, "'Dear me, Grandmama." What great arms you've got! They are so much better to hug you, my child, replied the wolf. But, Grandmama, said the little girl, what great ears you've got! They are so much better to hear you, my child, replied the wolf. But then, Grandmama, what great eyes you've got, said the little girl. They are so much better to see you, my child, replied the wolf. And Grandmama, what great teeth you've got, said the little girl, who now began to be rather afraid. They ought to eat you up, said the wolf. And saying these words, the wicked creature fell upon Little Red Riding Hood and ate her up in a moment. End of section. Recording by Michael Packard. Section 25 of fairy tales every child should know. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Packard. Fairy tales every child should know. 
edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. The Three Bears by Robert Southey The Three Bears In a far-off country there was once a little girl who was called Silver Hair, because her curly hair shone brightly. She was a sad romp, and so restless that she could not be kept quiet at home, but must needs run out and away without leave. One day she started off into a wood to gather wild flowers, and into the fields to chase butterflies. She ran here and she ran there, and went so far at last that she found herself in a lonely place, where she saw a snug little house, in which three bears lived. But they were not then at home. The door was ajar, and Silverhair pushed it open, and found the place to be quite empty. So she made up her mind to go in boldly, and look all about the place, little thinking what sort of people lived there. Now the three bears had gone out to walk a little before this. They were the big bear, and the middle-sized bear, and the little bear, and they had left their porridge on the table to cool. So when Silverhair came into the kitchen, she saw the three bowls of porridge. She tasted the largest bowl, which belonged to the big bear, and found it too cold. And then she tasted the middle-sized bowl, which belonged to the middle-sized bear, and she found it too hot. Then she tasted the smallest bowl, which belonged to the little bear, and it was just right and she ate it all. She went into the parlor, and there were three chairs. She tried the biggest chair, which belonged to the big bear, and found it too high. And she tried the middle-sized chair, which belonged to the middle-sized bear, and she found it too broad. Then she tried the little chair, which belonged to the little bear, and found it just right. But she sat in it so hard that she broke it. Now Silverhair was by this time very tired, and she went upstairs to the chamber, and there she found three beds. She tried the largest bed, which belonged to the big bear, and found it too soft. Then she tried the middle-sized bed, which belonged to the middle-sized bear, and she found it too hard. Then she tried the smallest bed, which belonged to the little bear, and found it just right. So she lay down upon it, and fell fast asleep. While Silver Hair was lying fast asleep, the three bears came home from their walk. They came into the kitchen to get their porridge, but the big bear went to his and growled out, Somebody has been tasting my porridge. And the middle-sized bear looked into his bowl and said, Somebody has been tasting my porridge. And the little bear piped, Somebody has tasted my porridge and eaten it all up. Then they went into the parlor, and the big bear growled, Somebody has been sitting in my chair. And the middle-sized bear said, Somebody has been sitting in my chair. And the little bear piped, Somebody has been sitting in my chair, and it has broken it all to pieces. So they went upstairs into the chamber, and the big bear growled, Somebody has been tumbling my bed. And the middle-sized bear said, Somebody's been tumbling my bed. And the little bear piped, Somebody's been tumbling in my bed, and there she is. At that, Silverhair woke in a fright, and jumped out of the window, and ran away as fast as her legs could carry her, and never went near the three bears' snug little house again. End of section 25 Recording by Michael Packard Section 26 of Fairy Tales Every Child Should Know This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jadopi Fairy Tales Every Child Should Know Edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe Section 26. The Princess on the Pea by Hans Christian Andersen There was once a prince who wanted to marry a princess, but she was to be a real princess, 
so he traveled about all through the world to find a real one, but everywhere there was something in the way. There were princesses enough, but whether they were real princesses he could not quite make out. There was always something that did not seem quite right. So he came home again and was quite sad, for he wished so much to have a real princess. One evening a terrible storm came on. It lightened and thundered. The rain streamed down. It was quite fearful. Then there was a knocking at the town gate, and the old king went out to open it. It was a princess who stood outside the gate, but mercy how she looked from the rain and the rough weather. The water ran down from her hair and her clothes. It ran in at the points of her shoes and out at the heels, and yet she declared that she was a real princess. Yes, we will soon find that out, thought the old queen. But she said nothing, only went into the bedchamber, took all the bedding off and put a pea on the flooring of the bedstead. Then she took twenty mattresses and laid them upon the pea, and then twenty eiderdown beds upon the mattresses. On this the princess had to lie all night. In the morning she was asked how she had slept. "'Oh, miserably,' said the princess. "'I scarcely closed my eyes all night long. Goodness knows what was in my bed. I lay upon something hard, so that I am black and blue all over. It is quite dreadful.' Now they saw that she was a real princess, for through the twenty mattresses and the twenty eiderdown beds she had felt the pea. No one but a real princess could be so delicate. So the prince took her for his wife, for now he knew that he had a true princess, and the pea was put in the museum, and it is there now, unless somebody has carried it off. Look you, this is a true story. End of section 26. Recording by Jadopi. www.jadopi.wordpress.com Section 27 of Fairy Tales Every Child Should Know. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Beth Thomas. Fairy Tales Every Child Should Know. Edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Section 23. The Ugly Duckling. From the tale by Hans Christian Andersen. It was so glorious out in the country. It was summer, the cornfields were yellow, the oats were green, the hay had been put up in stacks in the green meadows, and the stork went about on his long red legs and chattered Egyptian, for this was the language he had learned from his good mother. All around the fields and meadows were great forests, and in the midst of those forests lay deep lakes. Yes, it was right glorious out in the country. In the midst of the sunshine there lay an old farm, with deep canals about it, and from the wall down to the water grew great burdocks, so high that little children could stand upright under the loftiest of them. It was just as wild there as in the deepest wood, and here sat a duck upon her nest. She had to hatch her ducklings, but she was almost tired out before the little ones came, and then she so seldom had visitors. The other ducks liked better to swim about in the canals than to run up to sit down under a burdock and cackle with her. At last one eggshell after another burst open. Peep, peep! it cried, and in all the eggs there were little creatures that stuck out their heads. Quack, quack, they said, and they all came quacking out as fast as they could, looking all round them under the green leaves, and the mother let them look just as much as they chose, for green is good for the eye. How wide the world is, said all the young ones, for they certainly had much more room now than when they were in the eggs. Do you think this is all the world, said the mother? That stretches far across the other side of the garden, quite into the parson's field, but I have never been there yet. I hope you are all together, and she stood up. No, I have not all. The largest egg still lies there. How long is that to last? I am really tired of it. And she sat down again. Well, how goes it? asked an old duck who had come to pay her a visit. It lasts a long time with that one egg, said the duck who sat there. It will not burst. Now only look at the others. Are they not the prettiest little ducks one could possibly see? They are all like their father. The rogue, he never comes to see me. Let me see the egg which will not burst, said the old visitor. You may be sure it is a turkey's egg. I was once cheated in that way, and had much anxiety and trouble with the young ones, for they are afraid of the water. Must I say it to you, I could not get them to venture in. I quacked and I clacked, but it was no use. Let me see the egg. Yes, that's a turkey's egg. Let it lie there and teach the other children to swim. I think I will sit on it a little longer, said the duck. I've sat so long now that I can sit a few days more. Just as you please, then, said the old duck, and she went away. 
At last the great egg burst. Peep, peep, said the little one, and crept forth. It was very large and very ugly. The duck looked at it. It's a very large duckling, said she. None of the others look like that. Can it really be a turkey chick? Well, we shall soon find out. It must go into the water, even if I have to thrust it in myself. The next day it was bright, beautiful weather. The sun shone on all the green trees. The mother duck went down to the canal with all her family. Splash! She jumped into the water. Quack, quack! she said, and one duckling after another plunged in. The water closed over their heads, but they came up in an instant and swam capitally. Their legs went of themselves, and they were all in the water. The ugly grey duckling swam with them. No, it's not a turkey, said she. Look how well it can use its legs, and how straight it holds itself. It is my own child. On the whole, it's quite pretty, if one looks at it rightly. Quack, quack, come with me, and I'll lead you out into the great world and present you in the duckyard. But keep close to me so that no one may tread on you, and take care of the cats. And so they came into the duckyard. There was a terrible riot going on in there, for two families were quarrelling about an eel's head, and the cat got it after all. See, that's how it goes in the world, said the mother duck, and she wetted her beak, for she too wanted the eel's head. Only use your legs, she said. See that you can bustle about and bow your heads before the old duck yonder. She's the grandest of all here. She's of Spanish blood. That's why she's so fat, and you see, she has a red rag round her leg. That's something particularly fine, and the greatest distinction a duck can enjoy. It signifies that one does not want to lose her, and that she's to be known by the animals and by men too. Shake yourselves, don't turn in your toes. A well-brought-up duck turns its toes quite out, just like father and mother. So, now, bend your necks and say, quack. And they did so. But the other ducks round about looked at them and said quite boldly, Look there, now we're to have these hanging on, as if there were not enough of us already. And fie, how that duckling yonder looks, we won't stand that. And one duck flew up at it and bit it in the neck. Let it alone, said the mother. It does no harm to any one. Yes, but it's too large and peculiar, said the duck who had bitten it and therefore it must be put down. Those are pretty children that the mother has there, said the old duck with the rag around her leg. They're all pretty but that one. That was rather unlucky. I wish she could bear it over again. That cannot be done, my lady, replied the mother duck. It is not pretty, but it has a really good disposition, and it swims as well as any other. Yes, I may even say it swims better. I think it will grow up pretty, and become smaller in time. It has lain too long in the egg, and therefore is not properly shaped and then she pinched it in the neck and smoothed its feathers. Moreover, it is a drake, she said, and therefore it is not of so much consequence. I think he'll be very strong. He makes his way already. The other ducklings are graceful enough, said the old duck. Make yourself at home, and if you find an eel's head, you may bring it to me. And now they were home, but the poor duckling which had crept last out of the egg and looked so ugly was bitten and pushed and jeered as much by the ducks as by the chickens. It is too big, they all said, and the turkey cock, who had been born with spurs, and therefore thought himself an emperor, blew himself up like a ship in full sail, and bore straight down upon it. Then he gobbled and grew quite red in the face. The poor duckling did not know where it should stand or walk. It was quite melancholy because it looked ugly, and it was the butt of the whole duckyard. So it went on the first day, and afterwards it became worse and worse. The poor duckling was hunted about by everyone. Even its brothers and sisters were quite angry with it, and said, If only the cat would catch you, you ugly creature. And the mother said, If you were only far away. And the ducks bit it, and the chickens beat it, and the girl who had to feed the poultry kicked at it with her foot. Then it ran and flew over the fence, and the little birds in the bushes flew up in fear. That is because I am so ugly, thought the duckling, and it shut its eyes but flew on further, and so it came out into the great moor, where the wild ducks lived. Here it lay the whole night long, and it was weary and downcast. Towards morning the wild ducks flew up and looked at their new companion. What sort of a one are you? they asked, and the duckling turned in every direction and bowed as well as it could. You are remarkably ugly, said the wild ducks, but that is nothing to us, so long as you do not marry into our family. Poor thing, it certainly did not think of marrying, and only hoped to obtain leave to lie among the reeds and drink some of the swamp water. Thus it lay two whole days. Then came thither two wild geese, or, properly speaking, two wild ganders. It was not long since each had crept out of an egg, and that's why they were so saucy. Listen, comrade, said one, you're so ugly that I like you. Will you go with us and become a bird of passage? Near here in another moor there are a few sweet, wild, lovely geese, all unmarried and all able to say rap. You've a chance of making your fortune, ugly as you are. Piff-paff! resounded through the air, and the two ganders fell down dead in the swamp, and the water became blood-red. Piff-paff! sounded again, and the whole flock of wild geese rose up from the reeds, and there was another report. A great hunt was going on. The sportsmen were lying in wait all around the moor, and some were even sitting up in the branches of the trees which spread far over the reeds. The blue smoke rose up like clouds among the dark trees, and was wafted far away across the water, and the hunting dogs came, splash-splash! into the swamp, and the rushes and the reeds bent down on every side. That was a fright for the poor duckling. It turned its head and put it under its wing. 
but at that moment a frightful great dog stood close by the duckling his tongue hung far out of his mouth and his eyes gleamed horrible and ugly he thrust out his nose close against the duckling showed his sharp teeth and splash splash on he went without seizing it oh heaven be thanked sighed the duckling i'm so ugly that even the dog does not like to bite me and so it lay quite quiet while the shots rattled through the reeds and gun after gun was fired at last late in the day all was still but the poor duckling did not dare to rise up it waited several hours before it looked round and then hastened away out of the moor as fast as it could it ran on over field and meadow there was such a storm raging it was difficult to get from one place to another towards evening the duck came to a little miserable peasant's hut this hut was so dilapidated that it did not itself know on which side it should fall and that's why it remained standing the storm whistled round the duckling in such a way that the poor creature was obliged to sit down to stand against it and the wind blew worse and worse then the duckling noticed that one of the hinges of the door had given way and the door hung so slanting that the duckling could slip through the crack into the room and this is what it did here lived a woman with her cat and her hen and the cat whom she called sunny could arch his back and purr he could even give out sparks but to make him do it one had to stroke his fur the wrong way the hen had quite little short legs and therefore she was called chickabiddy shortshanks she laid good eggs and the woman loved her like her own child in the morning the strange duckling was at once noticed and the cat began to purr and the hen to cluck what's this said the woman and looked all around but she could not see well and therefore she thought the duckling was a fat duck that had strayed this is a rare prize she said now i shall have duck's eggs i hope it is not a drake we must try that and so the duckling was admitted on trial for three weeks but no eggs came and the cat was master of the house and the hen was the lady and always said we in the world for she thought they were half the world and by far the better half the duckling thought one might have a different opinion but the hen would not allow it can you lay eggs she asked no then will you hold your tongue and the cat said can you curve your back and purr and give out sparks no then you will please have no opinion of your own when sensible folks are speaking and the duckling sat in a corner and was melancholy then the fresh air and sunshine streamed in and it was seized with such a strange longing to swim on the water that it could not help telling the hen of it what are you thinking of cried the hen you have nothing to do that's why you have these fancies lay eggs or purr and they will pass over but it is so charming to swim on the water said the duckling so refreshing to let it close above one's head and to dive down to the bottom yes that must be a mighty pleasure truly quoth the hen i fancy you must have gone crazy ask the cat about it he's the cleverest animal i know ask him if he likes to swim on the water or to dive down i won't speak about it myself ask our mistress the old woman no one in the world is cleverer than she do you think she has any desire to swim and to let the water close above her head you don't understand me said the duckling we don't understand you then pray who is to understand you you surely don't pretend to be cleverer than the cat and the woman i won't say anything of myself don't be conceited child and thank your maker for all the kindness you have received did you not get into a warm room and have you not fallen into company from which you may learn something but you are a chatterer and it is not pleasant to associate with you you may believe me i speak for your good i tell you disagreeable things and by that one may always know one's true friends only take care that you learn to lay eggs or to purr and give out sparks i think i will go out into the wide world said the duckling yes do go replied the hen and so the duckling went away it swam on the water and dived but it was slighted by every creature because of its ugliness now came the autumn the leaves in the forest turned yellow and brown the wind caught them so that they danced about and up in the air it was very cold the clouds hung low heavy with hail and snowflakes and on the fence stood the raven crying crow crow for a mere cold yes it was enough to make one feel cold to think of this the poor duckling certainly had not a good time one evening the sun was just setting in his beauty there came a whole flock of great handsome birds out of the bushes they were dazzlingly white with long flexible necks they were swans they uttered a very peculiar cry spread forth their glorious great wings and flew away from that cold region to warmer lands to fair open lakes they mounted so high so high and the ugly duckling felt quite strangely as it watched them it turned round and round in the water like a wheel stretched out its neck towards them and uttered such a strange loud cry as frightened itself oh it could not forget those beautiful happy birds and so soon as it could see them no longer it dived down to the very bottom and when it came up again it was quite beside itself it knew not the name of those birds and knew not whether they were flying but it loved them more than it had ever loved any one it was not at all envious of them how could it think of wishing to possess such loveliness as they had it would have been glad if only the ducks would have endured its company the poor ugly creature and the winter grew cold very cold the duckling was forced to swim about in the water to prevent the surface from freezing entirely but every night the hole in which it swam about became smaller and smaller it froze so hard that the icy covering crackled again and the duckling was obliged to use its legs continually to prevent the hole from freezing up at last it became exhausted and lay quite still and thus froze fast into the ice 
Early in the morning a peasant came by, and when he saw what had happened, he took his wooden shoe, broke the ice crust to pieces, and carried the duckling home to his wife. Then it came to itself again. The children wanted to play with it, but the duckling thought they wanted to hurt it, and in its terror fluttered up into the milk pan so that the milk spurted down into the room. The woman clasped her hands, at which the duckling flew down into the butter tub, and then into the meal barrel, and out again. How it looked then! The woman screamed and struck at it with the fire tongs. The children tumbled over one another in their efforts to catch the duckling, and they laughed and they screamed. Well it was that the door stood open, and the poor creature was able to slip out between the shrubs into the newly fallen snow. And there it lay, quite exhausted. But it would be too melancholy if I were to tell all the misery and care which the duckling had to endure in the hard winter. It lay out in the moor among the reeds when the sun began to shine again and the larks to sing. It was a beautiful spring. Then all at once the duckling could flap its wings. They beat the air more strongly than before, and bore it strongly away, and before it well knew how all this happened, it found itself in a great garden where the elder trees smelt sweet and bent their long green branches down to the canal that wound through the region. Oh, here it was so beautiful, such a gladness of spring, and from the thicket came three glorious white swans. They rustled their wings and swam lightly on the water. The duckling knew the splendid creatures and felt oppressed by a peculiar sadness. I will fly away to them, to the royal birds, and they will beat me, because I that am so ugly dare to come near them, but it is all the same. Better to be killed by them than to be pursued by ducks and beaten by fowls and pushed about by the girl who takes care of the poultry yard, and to suffer hunger in winter. And it flew out into the water, and swam towards the beautiful swans. These looked at it, and came sailing down upon it with outspread wings. Kill me, said the poor creature, and bent its head upon the water, expecting nothing but death. But what was this that it saw in the clear water? it beheld its own image. And lo, it was no longer a clumsy dark grey bird, ugly and hateful to look at, but a swan. It matters nothing if one is born in a duckyard, if one has only lain in a swan's egg. It felt quite glad at all the need and misfortune it had suffered. Now it realised its happiness in all the splendour that surrounded it, and the great swans swam around it and struck it with their beaks. Into the garden came little children who threw bread and corn into the water, and the youngest cried, There is a new one! and the other children shouted joyously, "'Yes, yes, a new one has arrived!' And they clapped their hands and danced about, and ran to their father and mother. And bread and cake were thrown into the water, and they all said, "'The new one is the most beautiful of all, so young and handsome!' And the old swans bowed their heads before him. Then he felt quite ashamed, and hid his head under his wings, for he did not know what to do. He was so happy, and yet not at all proud. He thought how he had been persecuted and despised, and now he heard them saying that he was the most beautiful of all birds. Even the elder tree bent its branches straight down into the water before him, and the sun shone warm and mild. Then his wings rustled, he lifted his slender neck, and cried rejoicingly from the depths of his heart, I never dreamed of so much happiness when I was the ugly duckling. End of section 23 Read by Beth Thomas Section 28 of Fairy Tales Every Child Should Know This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kelly England. Fairy Tales Every Child Should Know. Edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Section 28. The Light Princess. By George MacDonald. Part 1. Chapter 1. What? No children? Once upon a time, so long ago that I have quite forgotten the date, there lived a king and queen who had no children. And the king said to himself, All the queens of my acquaintance have children, some three, some seven, and some as many as twelve, and my queen has not one. I feel ill-used. So he made up his mind to be cross with his wife about it, but she bore it all like a good patient queen as she was. Then the king grew very cross indeed. But the queen pretended to take it all as a joke, and a very good one, too. "'Why don't you have any daughters, at least?' he said. "'I don't say sons. That might be too much to expect.' "'I am sure, dear king, I am very sorry,' said the queen. "'You ought to be,' retorted the king. "'You are not going to make a virtue of that, surely.' He was not an ill-tempered king, and in any matter of less moment would have let the queen have her own way, with all of his heart. This, however, was an affair of state. The queen smiled. "'You must have patience with a lady, you know, dear king,' she said. She was, indeed, a very nice queen, and heartily sorry that she could not oblige the king immediately. The king tried to have patience, but he succeeded very badly. 
it was more than he deserved therefore when at last the queen gave him a daughter as lovely a little princess as ever cried chapter two won't i just the day grew near when the infant must be christened the king wrote all the invitations with his own hand of course somebody was forgotten now it does not generally matter if somebody is forgotten only you must mind who unfortunately the king forgot without intending to forget and so the chance fell upon the princess mac -et -moi, which was awkward for the princess was the king's own sister and he ought not to have forgotten her but she had made herself so disagreeable to the old king their father that he had forgotten her in making his will and so it was no wonder that her brother forgot her in writing his invitations but poor relations don't do anything to keep you in mind of them why don't they the king could not see into the garret she lived in could he she was a sour spiteful creature the wrinkles of contempt crossed the wrinkles of peevishness and made her face as full of wrinkles as a pat of butter if ever a king could be justified in forgetting anybody this king was justified in forgetting his sister even at a christening she looked very odd too her forehead was as large as all the rest of her face and projected over it like a precipice when she was angry her little eyes flashed blue when she hated anybody they shone yellow and green what they looked like when she loved anybody i do not know for i never heard of her loving anybody but herself and i don't think she would have managed that if she had not somehow got used to herself but what made it highly imprudent in the king to forget her was that she was awfully clever in fact she was a witch and when she bewitched anybody he very soon had enough of it for she beat all the wicked fairies in wickedness and all the clever ones in cleverness she despised all the modes we read of in history in which offended fairies and witches have taken their revenges and therefore after waiting and waiting in vain for an invitation she made up her mind at last to go without one and make the whole family miserable like a princess as she was so she put on her best gown went to the palace was kindly received by the happy monarch who forgot that he had forgotten her and took her place in the procession to the royal chapel when they were all gathered about the font she contrived to get next to it and throw something into the water after which she maintained a respectful demeanour till the water was applied to the child's face but at that moment she turned around in her place three times and muttered the following words loud enough for those beside her to hear light of spirit by my charms light of body every part never weary human arms only crush thy parent's heart they all thought she had lost her wits and was repeating some foolish nursery rhyme but a shudder went through the whole of them notwithstanding the baby on the contrary began to laugh and crow while the nurse gave a start and a smothered cry for she thought she was struck with paralysis she could not feel the baby in her arms but she clasped it tight and said nothing the mischief was done chapter three she can't be ours her atrocious aunt had deprived the child of all her gravity if you ask me how this was effected i answer in the easiest way in the world she had only to destroy gravitation for the princess was a philosopher and knew all the ins and outs of the laws of gravitation as well as the ins and outs of her bootlace and being a witch as well she could abrogate those laws in a moment or at least so clog their wheels and rust their bearings that they would not work at all but we have more to do with what followed than with how it was done the first awkwardness that resulted from this unhappy privation was that the moment the nurse began to float the baby up and down she flew from her arms toward the ceiling happily the resistance of the air brought her ascending career to a close within a foot of it there she remained horizontal as when she left her nurse's arms kicking and laughing amazingly the nurse in terror flew to the bell and begged the footman who answered it to bring up the house steps directly trembling in every limb she climbed upon the steps 
and had to stand upon the very top and reach up before she could catch the floating tail of the baby's long clothes. When the strange fact came to be known that there was a terrible commotion in the palace, the occasion of its discovery by the king was naturally a repetition of the nurse's experience. Astonished that he felt no weight when the child was laid in his arms, he began to wave her up, and not down, for she slowly ascended to the ceiling as before, and there remained floating in perfect comfort and satisfaction, as was testified by her peals of tiny laughter. The king stood staring up, in speechless amazement, and trembled so that his beard shook like grass in the wind. At last, turning to the queen, who was just as terror-struck as himself, he said gasping, staring and stammering, "'She can't be ours, queen!' Now the queen was much cleverer than the king, and had begun already to suspect that this effect defective came by cause. "'I'm sure she's ours,' answered she. "'But we ought to have taken better care of her at the christening. People who were never invited ought not to have been present.' "'Oh, no!' said the king, tapping his forehead with his forefinger. "'I have it all. I found her out. Don't you see it, queen? Princess Macamnion has bewitched her.' "'That's just what I say,' answered the queen. "'I beg your pardon, my love. I did not hear you. "'John, bring the steps I get on my throne with.' for he was a little king, with a great throne, like many other kings. The throne steps were brought, and set upon the dining-table, and John got upon the top of them, but he could not reach the little princess, who lay like a baby laughter-cloud in the air, exploding continuously. "'Take the tongs, John,' said his majesty, and getting up on the table, he handed them to him. John could reach the baby now, and the little princess was handed down by the tongs. End of section 28. Recording by Kelly England. Section 29 of Fairy Tales Every Child Should Know. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kelly England. Fairy Tales Every Child Should Know, edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Section 29, The Light Princess, George MacDonald. Part 2. Chapter 4. Where is she? One fine summer day, a month after these her first adventures, during which time she had been very carefully watched, the princess was lying on the bed in the queen's own chamber, fast asleep. One of the windows was open, for it was noon, and the day was so sultry that the little girl was wrapped in nothing less ethereal than slumber itself. The queen came into the room, and not observing that the baby was on the bed, opened another window. A frolicsome fairy wind, which had been watching for a chance of mischief, rushed in at the one window, and taking its way over the bed where the child was laying, caught her up and rolling and floating her along, like a piece of flue or a dandelion seed, carried her with it through the opposite window and away. The queen went downstairs, quite ignorant of the loss she had herself occasioned. When the nurse returned, she supposed that her majesty had carried her off, and dreading a scolding, delayed making inquiry about her. But hearing nothing, she grew uneasy and went at length to the queen's boudoir, where she found her majesty. "'Please, your majesty, shall I take the baby?' said she. "'Where is she?' asked the queen. "'Please forgive me. I know it was wrong.' "'What do you mean?' said the queen, looking grave. "'Oh, don't frighten me, your majesty,' exclaimed the nurse, clasping her hands. The queen saw that something was amiss, and fell down in a faint. The nurse rushed about the palace, screaming, "'My baby!' my baby every one ran to the queen's room but the queen could give no orders they soon found out however that the princess was missing and in a moment the palace was like a beehive in a garden and in one moment more the queen was brought to herself by a great shout and a clapping of hands they had found the princess fast asleep under a rose-bush to which the elfish little wind-puff had carried her 
finishing its mischief by shaking a shower of red rose leaves all over the little white sleeper. Startled by the noise the servants made, she woke, and furious with glee, scattered the rose leaves in all directions like a shower of spray in the sunset. She was watched more carefully after this, no doubt, yet it would be endless to relate all the odd incidents resulting from this peculiarity of the young princess. But there never was a baby in a house, not to say a palace, that kept the household in such constant good humor, at least below stairs. If it was not easy for her nurses to hold her, at least she made neither their arms nor their hearts ache, and she was so nice to play at ball with, there was positively no danger of letting her fall. They might throw her down, or knock her down, or push her down, but they couldn't let her down. It is true they might let her fly into the fire, or the coal hole, or through the window, but none of these accidents had happened as yet. If you heard peals of laughter resounding from some unknown region, you might be sure enough of the cause. Going down into the kitchen, or the room, you would find James and Thomas, Robert and Susan, all and some, playing at ball with the little princess. She was the ball herself, and did not enjoy it less for that. Away she went, flying from one to another, screeching with laughter, and the servants loved the ball itself better than the game. But they had to take some care how they threw her, for if she received an upward direction, she would never come down again without being fetched. Chapter 5. What is to be done? But above stairs it was different. One day, for instance, after breakfast, the king went into his counting-house and counted out his money. The operation gave him no pleasure. To think, said he to himself, that every one of these gold sovereigns weighs a quarter of an ounce and my real live flesh-and-blood princess weighs nothing at all and he hated his gold sovereigns as they lay with a broad smile of self-satisfaction all over their yellow faces the queen was in the parlor eating bread and honey but at the second mouthful she burst out crying and could not swallow it the king heard her sobbing glad of anybody but especially of his queen to quarrel with he clashed his gold sovereigns into his money-box clapped his crown on his head and rushed into the parlor what is all this about exclaimed he what are you crying for queen i can't eat it said the queen looking ruefully at the honey-pot no wonder retorted the king you've just eaten your breakfast two turkey legs and three anchovies oh that's not it sobbed her majesty it's my child my child well what's the matter with your child she's neither up the chimney nor down the draw-well, just hear her laughing. Yet the king could not help a sigh, which he tried to turn into a cough, saying, It is a good thing to be light-hearted, I am sure, whether she be ours or not. It is a bad thing to be light-headed, answered the queen, looking with prophetic soul far into the future. Tis a good thing to be light-handed, said the king. Tis a bad thing to be light-fingered, answered the queen. "'Tis a good thing to be light-footed,' said the king. "'Tis a bad thing,' began the queen, but the king interrupted her. "'In fact,' he said, with the tone of one who concludes an argument in which he has had only imaginary opponents, and in which, therefore, he has come off triumphant, "'in fact, it is a good thing altogether to be light-bodied. "'But it is a bad thing altogether to be light-minded,' retorted the queen, who was beginning to lose her temper. This last answer quite discomfited his majesty, who turned on his heel and betook himself to his counting-house again, but he was not half-way towards it when the voice of the queen overtook him. "'And it is a bad thing to be light-haired,' screamed the queen, determined to have more last words now that her spirit was rused. The queen's hair was black as night, and the king's had been, and his daughter's was, golden as morning." but it was not this reflection on his hair that arrested him. It was the double use of the word light, for the king hated all witticisms and punning especially. And besides, he could not tell whether the queen meant light-haired or light-aired. For why might she not aspirate her vowels when she was exasperated herself? 
he turned upon his other heel and rejoined her she looked angry still because she knew that she was guilty or what was much the same knew that he thought so my dear queen he said duplicity of any sort is exceedingly objectionable between married people of any rank not to say kings and queens and the most objectionable form duplicity can assume is that of punning there said the queen i have never made a jest but i broke it in the making and i am the most unfortunate woman in the world she looked so rueful that the king took her in his arms and they sat down to consult can you bear this said the king no i can't said the queen well what is to be done said the king i'm sure i don't know said the queen but might you not try an apology to my old sister i suppose you mean said the king yes said the queen well i don't mind said the king so he went the next morning to the house of the princess and making a very humble apology begged her to undo the spell but the princess declared with a grave face that she knew nothing at all about it her eyes however shone pink which was a sign that she was happy she advised the king and queen to have patience and to mend their ways the king returned disconsolate the queen tried to comfort him we will wait till she is older she may then be able to suggest something herself she will at least know how she feels and explain things to us but what if she should marry exclaimed the king in sudden consternation of the idea well what of that rejoined the queen just think if she were to have children in the course of a hundred years the air might be as full of floating children as of gossamers in autumn but that's no business of ours replied the queen besides by that time they will have learned to take care of themselves a sigh was the king's only answer he would have consulted the court physicians but he was afraid they would try experiments upon her chapter six she laughs too much meantime notwithstanding awkward occurrences and griefs that she brought upon her parents the little princess laughed and grew not fat but plump and tall she reached the age of seventeen without having fallen into any worse scrape than a chimney by rescuing her from which a little bird-nesting urchin got fame and a black face nor thoughtless as she was had she committed anything worse than laughter at everybody and everything that came her way when she was told for the sake of experiment that general clanrenfort was cut into pieces with all of his troops she laughed and when she heard that the enemy was on his way to besiege her father's capital she laughed hugely but when she was told that the city would certainly be abandoned to the mercy of the enemy's soldiery why then she laughed immoderately she never could be brought to see the serious side of anything when her mother cried she said what queer faces mamma makes and she squeezes water out of her cheeks funny mamma and when her papa stormed at her she laughed and danced round and round him clapping her hands and crying do it again papa do it again it's such fun dear funny papa and if he tried to catch her she glided from him in an instant not in the least afraid of him but thinking it part of the game not to be caught with one push of her foot she would be floating in the air above his head or she would go dancing backwards and forwards and sideways like a great butterfly it happened several times when her father and mother were holding a consultation about her in private that they were interrupted by vainly repressed outbursts of laughter over their heads and looking up with indignation saw her floating at full length in the air above them whence she regarded them with the most comical appreciation of the position one day an awkward accident happened the princess had come out upon the lawn with one of her attendants who held her by the hand spying her father at the other side of the lawn she snatched her hand from the maids and sped across to him now when she wanted to run alone her custom was to catch up a stone in each hand so that she might come down again after a bound whatever she wore as part of her attire had no effect in this way even gold when it thus became as it were part of herself lost all of its weight for the time but whatever she only held in her hands retained its downward tendency 
on this occasion she could see nothing to catch up but a huge toad that was walking across the lawn as if he had a hundred years to do it in not knowing what disgust meant for this was one of her peculiarities she snatched up the toad and bounded away she had almost reached her father and he was holding out his arms to receive her and take from her lips the kiss which hovered on them like a butterfly on a rosebud when a puff of wind blew her aside into the arms of a young page who had just been receiving a message from his majesty now it was no great peculiarity in the princess that once she was set a-going it always cost her time and trouble to check herself on this occasion there was no time she must kiss and she kissed the page she did not mind it much for she had no shyness in her composition and she knew besides that she could not help it so she only laughed like a musical box the poor page fared the worst for the princess trying to correct the unfortunate tendency of the kiss put out her hands to keep off the page so that along with the kiss he received on the other cheek a slap with the huge black toad which she poked right into his eye he tried to laugh too but the attempt resulted in such an odd contortion of countenance as showed that there was no danger of his pluming himself on the kiss as for the king his dignity was greatly hurt and he did not speak to the page for a whole month i may here remark that it was very amusing to see her run if her mode of progression could properly be called running for first she would make a bound then having alighted she would run a few steps and make another bound sometimes she would fancy she had reached the ground before she actually had and her feet would go backwards and forwards running upon nothing at all like those of a chicken on its back then she would laugh like the very spirit of fun only in her laugh there was something missing what it was i find myself unable to describe i think it was a certain tone depending upon the possibility of sorrow morbidezza perhaps she never smiled End of section 29. Recording by Kelly England. Section 30 of Fairy Tales Every Child Should Know. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jean Bascom. Fairy Tales Every Child Should Know. Edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Section 30. The Light Princess. By George MacDonald. Part 3. Chapter 7. Try Metaphysics. After a long avoidance of the painful subject, the king and queen resolved to hold a council of three upon it, and so they sent for the princess in she came sliding and flitting and gliding from one piece of furniture to another and put herself at last in an armchair in a sitting posture whether she could be said to sit seeing she received no support from the seat of the chair i do not pretend to determine my dear child said the king you must be aware by this time that you are not exactly like other people oh you dear funny papa i have got a nose and two eyes and all the rest so have you so has mamma now be serious my dear for once said the queen no thank you mamma i had rather not would you not like to be able to walk like other people said the king no indeed i should think not you only crawl you are such slow coaches how do you feel my child he resumed after a pause of discomfiture quite well thank you i mean what do you feel like like nothing at all that i know of you must feel like something i feel like a princess with such a funny papa and such a dear pet of a queen mamma now really began the queen but the princess interrupted her oh yes she added i remember i have a curious feeling sometimes as if i were the only person that had any sense in the whole world she had been trying to behave herself with dignity but now she burst into a violent fit of laughter threw herself backwards over the chair and went rolling about the floor in an ecstasy of enjoyment the king picked her up easier than one does a down quilt and replaced her in her former relation to the chair the exact preposition expressing this relation i do not happen to know is there nothing you wish for resumed the king who had learned by this time that it was useless to be angry with her oh you dear papa yes answered she 
what is it, my darling? I have been longing for it, oh, such a time, ever since last night. Tell me what it is. Will you promise to let me have it? The king was on the point of saying yes, but the wiser queen checked him with a single motion of her head. Tell me first what it is, said he. No, no, promise first. I dare not. What is it? Mind, I hold you to your promise. It is to be tied to the end of a string, a very long string indeed, and be flown like a kite. Oh, such fun! I would rain rose water and hail sugar plums and snow whipped cream, and, and, and... A fit of laughing checked her. She would have been off again over the floor had not the king started up and caught her just in time. Seeing that nothing but talk could be got out of her, he rang the bell and sent her away with two of her ladies-in-waiting. "'Now, queen,' he said, turning to her majesty, "'what is to be done?' "'There is but one thing left,' answered she. "'Let us consult the College of Metaphysicians.' "'Bravo!' cried the king. "'We will!' Now at the head of this college were two very wise Chinese philosophers, by name Humdrum and Kopi Kek. For them the king sent, and straightway they came. In a long speech he communicated to them what they knew very well already, as who did not, namely the peculiar condition of his daughter in relation to the globe on which she dwelt, and requested them to consult together as to what might be the cause and probable cure of her infirmity. The king laid stress upon the word, but failed to discover his own pun. The queen laughed, but Humdrum and Kopi Kek heard with humility and retired in silence. Their consultation consisted chiefly in propounding and supporting, for the thousandth time, each his favorite theories. For the condition of the princess afforded delightful scope for the discussion of every question arising from the division of thought, in fact, of all the metaphysics of the Chinese empire. But it is only justice to say that they did not altogether neglect the discussion of the practical question, what was to be done. Humdrum was a materialist, and Kopi Kek was a spiritualist. The former was slow and sententious, the latter was quick and flighty. The latter had generally the first word, the former the last. "'I reassert my former assertion,' began Kopi Kek, with a plunge. "'There is not a fault in the princess, body or soul. Only they are wrong put together. Listen to me now, Humdrum, and I will tell you in brief what I think. Don't speak, don't answer me, I won't hear you till I have done.' At that decisive moment, when souls seek their appointed habitations, two eager souls met, struck, rebounded, lost their way, and arrived each at the wrong place. The soul of the princess was one of those, and she went far astray. She does not belong by rights to this world at all, but to some other planet, probably Mercury. Her proclivity to her true sphere destroys all the natural influence which this orb would otherwise possess over her corporeal frame. She cares for nothing here. There is no relation between her and this world. She must therefore be taught by the sternest compulsion to take an interest in the earth as the earth. She must study every department of its history, its animal history, its vegetable history, its mineral history, its social history, its moral history, its political history, its scientific history, its literary history, its musical history, its artistical history, above all its metaphysical history. She must begin with the Chinese dynasty and end with Japan. But first of all, she must study geology, and especially the history of the extinct races of animals, their natures, their habits, their loves, their hates, their revenges. She must— "'Hold! Hold!' roared Humdrum. "'It is certainly my turn now. My rooted and insubversible conviction is that the causes of the anomalies evident in the princess's condition are strictly and solely physical. But that is only tantamount to acknowledging that they exist. Hear my opinion.' from some cause or another of no importance to our inquiry the motion of her heart has been reversed that remarkable combination of the suction and the force pump works the wrong way i mean in the case of the unfortunate princess it draws in where it should force out and forces out where it should draw in the offices of the auricles and the ventricles are subverted the blood is sent forth by the veins and returned by the arteries consequently it is running the wrong way through all her corporeal organism lungs and all is it then at all mysterious seeing that such is the case that on the other particular of gravitation as well she should differ from normal humanity my proposal for the cure is this phlebotomize until she is reduced to the last point of safety let it be effected if necessary in a warm bath when she is reduced to a state of perfect asphyxy, apply a ligature to the left ankle, drawing it as tight as the bone will bear. Apply at the same moment another of equal tension around the right wrist, by means of plates constructed for the purpose. Place the other foot and hand under the receivers of two air pumps. 
exhaust the receivers exhibit a pint of french brandy and await the result which would presently arrive in the form of grim death said kopy keck if it should she would yet die in doing our duty retorted humdrum but their majesties had too much tenderness for their volatile offspring to subject her to either of the schemes of the equally unscrupulous philosophers indeed the most complete knowledge of the laws of nature would have been unserviceable in her case for it was impossible to classify her she was a fifth imponderable body sharing all the other properties of the ponderable chapter eight try a drop of water perhaps the best thing for the princess would have been to fall in love but how a princess who has no gravity could fall into anything is a difficulty perhaps the difficulty as for her own feelings on the subject she did not even know that there was such a beehive of honey and stings to be fallen into but now i come to mention another curious fact about her the palace was built on the shores of the loveliest lake in the world and the princess loved this lake more than father or mother the root of this preference no doubt although the princess did not recognize it as such was that the moment she got into it she recovered the natural right of which she had been so wickedly deprived namely gravity whether this was owing to the fact that water had been employed as the means of conveying the injury i do not know but it is certain that she could swim and dive like the duck that her old nurse said she was the manner in which this alleviation of her misfortune was discovered was as follows one summer evening during the carnival of the country she had been taken upon the lake by the king and queen in the royal barge they were accompanied by many of the courtiers in a fleet of little boats in the middle of the lake she wanted to get into the lord chancellor's barge for his daughter who was a great favourite with her was in it with her father now though the old king rarely condescended to make light of his misfortune yet happening on this occasion to be in a particularly good humour as the barges approached each other he caught up the princess to throw her into the chancellor's barge he lost his balance however and dropping into the bottom of the barge lost his hold of his daughter not however before imparting to her the downward tendency of his own person though in a somewhat different direction for as the king fell into the boat she fell into the water with a burst of delighted laughter she disappeared into the lake a cry of horror ascended from the boats they had never seen the princess go down before half the men were under water in a moment but they had all one after another come up to the surface again for breath when tinkle tinkle babble and gush came the princess's laughter over the water from far away there she was swimming like a swan nor would she come out for king or queen chancellor or daughter she was perfectly obstinate but at the same time she seemed more sedate than usual perhaps that was because a great pleasure spoils laughing at all events after this the passion of her life was to get into the water and she was always the better behaved and the more beautiful the more she had of it summer and winter it was quite the same only she could not stay so long in the water when they had to break the ice to let her in any day from morning to evening in summer she might be descried a streak of white in the blue water lying as still as the shadow of a cloud or shooting along like a dolphin disappearing and coming up again far off just where one did not expect her she would have been in the lake of a night too if she could have had her way for the balcony of her window overhung a deep pool in it and through a shallow reedy passage she could have swum out into the wide wet water and no one would have been any the wiser indeed when she happened to wake in the moonlight she could hardly resist the temptation but there was the sad difficulty of getting into it she had as great a dread of the air as some children have of the water for the slightest gust of wind would blow her away and a gust might arise in the stillest moment and if she gave herself a push towards the water and just failed of reaching it her situation would be dreadfully awkward irrespective of the wind for at best there she would have to remain suspended in her nightgown till she was seen and angled for by somebody from the window oh if i had my gravity thought she contemplating the water i would flash off this balcony like a long white sea-bird headlong into the darling wetness Hi ho this was the only consideration that made her wish to be like other people another reason for her being fond of the water was that in it alone she enjoyed any freedom for she could not walk without a cortege consisting in part of a troop of light horse for fear of the liberties which the wind might take with her and the king grew more apprehensive with increasing years till at last he would not allow her to walk abroad at all without some twenty silken cords fastened to as many parts of her dress and held by twenty noblemen of course horseback was out of the question but she bade good-bye to all this ceremony when she got into the water 
and so remarkable were its effects upon her especially in restoring her for the time to the ordinary human gravity that humdrum and kopy keck agreed in recommending to the king to bury her alive for three years in the hope that as the water did her so much good the earth would do her yet more but the king had some vulgar prejudices against the experiment and would not give his consent foiled in this they yet agreed in another recommendation which seeing that one imported his opinions from china and the other from tibet was very remarkable indeed they argued that if water of external origin and application could be so efficacious water from a deeper source might work a perfect cure in short that if the poor afflicted princess could only by any means be made to cry she might recover her lost gravity but how was this to be brought about therein lay all the difficulty to meet which the philosophers were not wise enough to make the princess cry was as impossible as to make her way they sent for a professional beggar commanded him to prepare his most touching oracle of woe helped him out of the court charade box to whatever he wanted for dressing up and promised great rewards in the event of his success but it was all in vain she listened to the mendicant artist's story and gazed at his marvellous make-up till she could contain herself no longer and went into the most undignified contortions for relief shrieking positively screeching with laughter when she had a little recovered herself she ordered her attendants to drive him away and not give him a single copper whereupon his look of mortified discomfiture wrought her punishment and his revenge for he sent her into violent hysterics from which she was with difficulty recovered but so anxious was the king that the suggestion should have a fair trial that he put himself in a rage one day and rushing up to her room gave her an awful whipping yet not a tear would flow she looked grave and her laughing sounded uncommonly like screaming that was all the good old tyrant though he put on his best gold spectacles to look could not discover the smallest cloud in the serene blue of her eyes chapter nine put me in again it must have been about this time that the son of a king who lived a thousand miles from lagobel set out to look for the daughter of a queen he travelled far and wide but as sure as he found a princess he found some fault with her of course he could not marry a mere woman however beautiful and there was no princess to be found worthy of him whether the prince was so near perfection that he had a right to demand perfection itself i cannot pretend to say all i know is that he was a fine handsome brave generous well-bred and well-behaved youth as all princes are in his wanderings he had come across some reports about our princess but as everybody said she was bewitched he never dreamed that she could bewitch him for what indeed could a prince do with a princess that had lost her gravity who could tell what she might not lose next she might lose her visibility or her tangibility or in short the power of making impressions upon the radical sensorium so that he should never be able to tell whether she was dead or alive of course he made no further inquiries about her one day he lost sight of his retinue in a great forest these forests are very useful in delivering princes from their courtiers like a sieve that keeps back the bran then the princes get away to follow their fortunes in this way they had the advantage of the princesses who are forced to marry before they have had a bit of fun i wish our princess got lost in a forest sometimes one lovely evening after wandering about for many days he found that he was approaching the outskirts of this forest for the trees had got so thin that he could see the sunset through them and he soon came upon a kind of heath next he came upon signs of human neighbourhood but by this time it was getting late and there was nobody in the fields to direct him after travelling for another hour his horse quite worn out with the long labour and lack of food fell and was unable to rise again so he continued his journey on foot at length he entered another wood not a wild forest but a civilised wood through which a footpath led him to the side of a lake along this path the prince pursued his way through the gathering darkness suddenly he paused and listened strange sounds came across the water it was in fact the princess laughing now there was something odd in her laugh as i have already hinted for the hatching of a real hearty laugh requires the incubation of gravity and perhaps this was how the prince mistook the laughter for screaming looking over the lake he saw something white in the air and in an instant he had torn off his tunic kicked off his sandals and plunged in he soon reached the white object and found that it was a woman there was not light enough to show that she was a princess but quite enough to show that she was a lady for it does not want much light to see that now i cannot tell how it came about whether she pretended to be drowning or whether he frightened her or caught her so as to embarrass her 
but certainly he brought her to shore in a fashion ignominious to a swimmer and more nearly drowned than she had ever expected to be for the water had got into her throat as often as she tried to speak at the place to which he bore her the bank was only a foot or two above the water so he gave her a strong lift out of the water to lay her on the bank but her gravitation ceasing the moment she left the water away she went up into the air scolding and screaming you naughty 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 man she cried no one had ever succeeded in putting her into a passion before when the prince saw her ascend he thought he must have been bewitched and have mistaken a great swan for a lady but the princess caught hold of the topmost cone upon a lofty fir this came off but she caught at another and in fact stopped herself by gathering cones dropping them as the stalks gave way the prince meantime stood in the water staring and forgetting to get out but the princess disappearing he scrambled on shore and went in the direction of the tree there he found her climbing down one of the branches towards the stem but in the darkness of the wood the prince continued in some bewilderment as to what the phenomenon could be until reaching the ground and seeing him standing there she caught hold of him and said i'll tell papa oh no you won't returned the prince yes i will she persisted what business had you to pull me down out of the water and throw me to the bottom of the air i never did you any harm pardon me i did not mean to hurt you i don't believe you have any brains and that is a worse loss than your wretched gravity i pity you the prince now saw that he had come upon the bewitched princess and had already offended her but before he could think what to say next she burst out angrily giving a stamp with her foot that would have sent her aloft again but for the hold she had of his arm put me up directly put you up where you beauty asked the prince he had fallen in love with her almost already for her anger made her more charming than any one else had ever beheld her and as far as he could see which certainly was not very far she had not a single fault about her except of course that she had not any gravity no prince however would judge of a princess by weight the loveliness of her foot he would hardly estimate by the depth of the impression it could make in mud put you up where you beauty asked the prince in the water you stupid answered the princess come then said the prince the condition of her dress increasing her usual difficulty in walking compelled her to cling to him and he could hardly persuade himself that he was not in a delightful dream notwithstanding the torrent of musical abuse with which she overwhelmed him the prince being therefore in no hurry they came upon the lake at quite another part where the bank was twenty-five feet high at least and when they had reached the edge he turned toward the princess and said how am i to put you in that is your business she answered quite snappishly you took me out put me in again very well said the prince and catching her up in his arms he sprang with her from the rock the princess had just time to give one delighted shriek of laughter before the water closed over them when they came to the surface she found that for a moment or two she could not even laugh for she had gone down with such a rush that it was with difficulty she recovered her breath the instant they reached the surface how do you like falling in said the prince after some effort the princess panted out is that what you call falling in yes answered the prince i should think it a very tolerable specimen it seemed to me like going up rejoined she my feeling was certainly one of elevation too the prince conceded the princess did not appear to understand him for she retorted his question how do you like falling in said the princess beyond everything answered he for i have fallen in with the only perfect creature i ever saw no more of that i am tired of it said the princess perhaps she shared her father's aversion to punning don't you like falling in then said the prince it is the most delightful fun i ever had in my life answered she i never fell before i wish i could learn to think i am the only person in my father's kingdom that can't fall here the poor princess looked almost sad i shall be most happy to fall in with you any time you like said the prince devotedly thank you i don't know perhaps it would not be proper but i don't care at all events as we have fallen in let us have a swim together with all my heart responded the prince and away they went swimming and diving and floating until at last they heard cries along the shore and saw lights glancing in all directions it was now quite late and there was no moon i must go home said the princess i am very sorry for this is delightful so am i returned the prince but i am glad i haven't got a home to go to at least i don't exactly know where it is i wish i hadn't one either rejoined the princess it is so stupid i have a great mind she continued to play them all a trick why couldn't they leave me alone they won't trust me in the lake for a single night you see where that green light is burning that is the window of my room now if you would just swim there with me very quietly and when we are all but under the balcony give me such a push up you call it as you did a little while ago i should be able to catch hold of the balcony and get in at the window and then they may look for me till tomorrow morning 
with more obedience than pleasure said the prince gallantly and away they swam very gently will you be in the lake to-morrow night the prince ventured to ask to be sure i will i don't think so perhaps was the princess's somewhat strange answer but the prince was intelligent enough not to press her further and merely whispered as he gave her the parting lift don't tell the only answer the princess returned was a roguish look she was already a yard above his head the look seemed to say never fear it is too good fun to spoil that way so perfectly like other people had she been in the water that even yet the prince could scarcely believe his eyes when he saw her ascend slowly grasp the balcony and disappear through the window he turned almost expecting to see her still by his side but he was alone in the water so he swam away quietly and watched the lights roving about the shore for hours after the princess was safe in her chamber as soon as they disappeared he landed in search of his tunic and sword and after some trouble found them again then he made the best of his way round the lake to the other side there the wood was wilder and the shore steeper rising more immediately towards the mountains which surrounded the lake on all sides and kept sending it messages of silvery streams from morning to night and all night long he soon found a spot where he could see the green light in the princess's room, and where, even in the broad daylight, he would be in no danger of being discovered from the opposite shore. It was a sort of cave in the rock, where he provided himself a bed of withered leaves, and lay down too tired for hunger to keep him awake. All night long he dreamed that he was swimming with the princess. End of section 30 Recording by Jean Bascom, Potomac, Maryland Section thirty one of Fairy Tales Every Child Should Know. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jean Bascom. Fairy Tales Every Child Should Know. Edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Section thirty one The Light Princess by George MacDonald. Part four. Chapter ten. Look at the moon. Early the next morning the prince set out to look for something to eat, which he soon found at a forester's hut, where for many following days he was supplied with all that a brave prince could consider necessary, and having plenty to keep him alive for the present, he would not think of wants not yet in existence. Whenever care intruded, this prince always bowed him out in the most princely manner when he returned from his breakfast to his watch cave he saw the princess already floating about in the lake attended by the king and queen whom he knew by their crowns and a great company in lovely little boats with canopies of all the colours of the rainbow and flags and streamers of a great many more it was a very bright day and the prince burned up with the heat began to long for the cold water and the cool princess but he had to endure till twilight, for the boats had provisions on board, and it was not till the sun went down that the gay party began to vanish. Boat after boat drew away to the shore, following that of the king and queen, till only one, apparently the princess's own boat, remained. But she did not want to go home even yet, and the prince thought he saw her order the boat to the shore without her. At all events it rode away, and now, of all the radiant company, only one white speck remained then the prince began to sing and this is what he sung lady fair swan white lift thine eyes banish night by the might of thine eyes snowy arms oars of snow o'er her hither plashing low soft and slow o'er her hither stream behind her o'er the lake radiant whiteness in her wake following following for her sake radiant whiteness cling about her waters blue part not from her but renew cold and true kisses round her lap me round waters sad that have left her make me glad for ye had kissed her ere ye left her before he had finished his song the princess was just under the place where he sat and looking up to find him her ears had led her truly would you like a fall princess said the prince looking down ah there you are yes if you please prince said the princess looking up how do you know i am a prince princess said the prince because you are a very nice young man prince said the princess come up then princess fetch me prince the prince took off his scarf then his sword belt then his tunic and tied them all together and let them down but the line was far too short 
he unwound his turban and added it to the rest when it was all but long enough and his purse completed it the princess just managed to lay hold of the knot of money and was beside him in a moment this rock was much higher than the other and the splash and the dive were tremendous the princess was in ecstasies of delight and their swim was delicious night after night they met and swam about in the dark clear lake where such was the prince's gladness that whether the princess's way of looking at things infected him or he was actually getting light-headed he often fancied that he was swimming in the sky instead of the lake but when he talked about being in heaven the princess laughed at him dreadfully when the moon came she brought them fresh pleasure everything looked strange and new in her light with an old withered yet unfading newness when the moon was nearly full one of their great delights was to dive deep in the water and then turning round look up through it at the great blot of light close above them shimmering and trembling and wavering spreading and contracting seeming to melt away and again grow solid then they would shoot up through the blot and lo there was the moon far off clear and steady and cold and very lovely at the bottom of a deeper and bluer lake than theirs as the princess said the prince soon found out that while in the water the princess was very like other people and besides this she was not so forward in her questions or pert in her replies at sea as on the shore neither did she laugh so much and when she did laugh it was more gently she seemed altogether more modest and maidenly in the water than out of it but when the prince who had really fallen in love when he fell in the lake began to talk to her about love she always turned her head towards him and laughed after a while she began to look puzzled as if she were trying to understand what he meant but could not revealing a notion that he meant something but as soon as ever she left the lake she was so altered that the prince said to himself if i marry her i see no help for it we must turn merman and mermaid and go out to sea at once chapter eleven hiss the princess's pleasure in the lake had grown to a passion and she could scarcely bear to be out of it for an hour imagine then her consternation when diving with the prince one night a sudden suspicion seized her that the lake was not so deep as it used to be the prince could not imagine what had happened she shot to the surface and without a word swam at full speed towards the higher side of the lake he followed begging to know if she was ill or what was the matter she never turned her head or took the smallest notice of his question arrived at the shore she coasted the rocks with minute inspection but she was not able to come to a conclusion for the moon was very small and so she could not see well she turned therefore and swam home without saying a word to explain her conduct to the prince of whose presence she seemed no longer conscious he withdrew to his cave in great perplexity and distress next day she made many observations which alas strengthened her fears she saw that the banks were too dry and that the grass on the shore and the trailing plants on the rocks were withering away she caused marks to be made along the borders and examined them day after day in all directions of the wind till at last the horrible idea became a certain fact that the surface of the lake was slowly sinking the poor princess nearly went out of the little mind she had it was awful to her to see the lake which she loved more than any living thing lie dying before her eyes it sank away slowly vanishing the tops of rocks that had never been seen till now began to appear far down in the clear water before long they were dry in the sun it was fearful to think of the mud that would soon lie there baking and festering full of lovely creatures dying and ugly creatures coming to life like the unmaking of a world and how hot the sun would be without any lake she could not bear to swim in it any more and began to pine away her life seemed bound up with it and ever as the lake sank she pined people said she would not live an hour after the lake was gone but she never cried proclamation was made to all the kingdom that whosoever should discover the cause of the lake's decrease would be rewarded after a princely fashion humdrum and kopy keck applied themselves to their physics and metaphysics but in vain not even they could suggest a cause now the fact was that the old princess was at the root of the mischief when she heard that her niece found more pleasure in the water than any one else had out of it she went into a rage and cursed herself for her want of foresight but said she i will soon set all right the king and the people shall die of thirst their brains shall boil and frizzle in their skulls before i will lose my revenge and she laughed a ferocious laugh that made the hairs on the back of her black cat stand erect with terror 
Then she went to an old chest in the room, and opening it, took out what looked like a piece of dried seaweed. This she threw into a tub of water. Then she threw some powder into the water and stirred it with her bare arm, muttering over it words of hideous sound and yet more hideous import. Then she set the tub aside and took from the chest a huge bunch of a hundred rusty keys that clattered in her shaking hands. Then she sat down and proceeded to oil them all. Before she had finished, out from the tub, the water of which had kept on a slow motion ever since she had ceased stirring it, came the head and half the body of a huge grey snake. But the witch did not look round. It grew out of the tub, waving itself backwards and forwards with a slow horizontal motion till it reached the princess, when it laid its head upon her shoulder and gave a low hiss in her ear. She started, but with joy, and seeing the head resting on her shoulder, drew it towards her and kissed it. Then she drew it all out of the tub and wound it round her body. It was one of those dreadful creatures which few have ever beheld, the white snakes of darkness. Then she took the keys and went down to her cellar, and as she unlocked the door she said to herself, This is worth living for. Locking the door behind her, she descended a few steps into the cellar, and crossing it unlocked another door into a dark, narrow passage. She unlocked this also behind her and descended a few more steps. If any one had followed the witch princess, he would have heard her unlock exactly one hundred doors, and descend a few steps after unlocking each. When she had unlocked the last, she entered a vast cave, the roof of which was supported by huge natural pillars of rock. Now this roof was the underside of the bottom of the lake. She then untwined the snake from her body, and held it by the tail high above her, the hideous creature stretched up its head towards the roof of the cavern, which it was just able to reach. It then began to move its head backwards and forwards with a slow, oscillating motion, as if looking for something. At the same moment the witch began to walk round and round the cavern, coming nearer to the centre every circuit, while the head of the snake described the same path over the roof that she did over the floor, for she kept holding it up. And still it kept slowly osculating. Round and round the cavern they went, ever lessening the circuit, till at last the snake made a sudden dart, and clung to the roof with its mouth. "'That's right, my beauty,' cried the princess. "'Drain it dry!' She let it go, left it hanging, and sat down on a great stone, with her black cat, which had followed her all round the cave, by her side. Then she began to knit and mutter awful words." The snake hung like a huge leech, sucking at the stone. The cat stood with his back arched, and his tail like a piece of cable, looking up at the snake, and the old woman sat and knitted and muttered. Seven days and seven nights they remained thus, when suddenly the serpent dropped from the roof as if exhausted, and shriveled up till it was again like a piece of dried seaweed. The witch started to her feet, picked it up, put it in her pocket, and looked up at the roof. One drop of water was trembling on the spot where the snake had been sucking. As soon as she saw that, she turned and fled, followed by her cat. Shutting the door in a terrible hurry, she locked it, and having muttered some frightful words, sped to the next, which also she locked and muttered over. And so, with all the hundred doors, till she arrived in her own cellar, then she sat down on the floor, ready to faint, but listening with malicious delight to the rushing of the water, which she could hear distinctly through all the hundred doors. But this was not enough. Now that she had tasted revenge, she lost her patience. Without further measures, the lake would be too long in disappearing. So the next night, with the last shred of the dying old moon rising, she took some of the water in which she had revived the snake, put it in a bottle, and set out, accompanied by her cat. Before morning she had made the entire circuit of the lake, muttering fearful words as she crossed every stream, and casting into it some of the water out of her bottle. When she had finished the circuit she muttered yet again, and flung a handful of the water towards the moon. Thereupon every spring in the country ceased to throb and bubble, dying away like the pulse of a dying man. The next day there was no sound of falling water to be heard along the borders of the lake, the very courses were dry, and the mountains showed no silvery streaks down their dark sides. And not alone had the fountains of Mother Earth ceased to flow, for all the babies throughout the country were crying dreadfully, only without tears. Chapter 12 Where is the Prince? 
Never since the night when the princess left him so abruptly had the prince had a single interview with her. He had seen her once or twice in the lake, but as far as he could discover, she had not been in it any more at night. He had sat and sung and looked in vain for his nereid, while she, like a true nereid, was wasting away with her lake, sinking as it sank, withering as it dried. When at length he discovered the change that was taking place in the level of the water, he was in great alarm and perplexity. He could not tell whether the lake was dying because the lady had forsaken it, or whether the lady would not come because the lake had begun to sink, but he resolved to know so much at least. He disguised himself, and, going to the palace, requested to see the Lord Chamberlain. His appearance at once gained his request, and the Lord Chamberlain, being a man of some insight, perceived that there was more in the prince's solicitation than met the ear. He felt likewise that no one could tell whence a solution of the present difficulties might arise. So he granted the prince's prayer to be made shoe-black to the princess. It was rather cunning in the prince to request such an easy post, for the princess could not possibly soil as many shoes as other princesses. He soon learned all that could be told about the princess. He went nearly distracted, but after roaming about the lake for days and diving in every depth that remained, all that he could do was to put an extra polish on the dainty pair of boots that was never called for. For the princess kept her room, with the curtains drawn to shut out the dying lake, but could not shut it out of her mind for a moment. It haunted her imagination, so that she felt as if the lake were her soul, drying up within her, first to mud, then to madness and death. She thus brooded over the change, with all its dreadful accompaniments, till she was nearly distracted. As for the prince, she had forgotten him. However much she had enjoyed his company in the water, she did not care for him without it but she seemed to have forgotten her father and mother, too. The lake went on sinking. Small, slimy spots began to appear, which glittered steadily amidst the changeful shine of the water. These grew to broad patches of mud, which widened and spread, with rocks here and there, and floundering fishes and crawling eels swarming. The people went everywhere catching these, and looking for anything that might have dropped from the royal boats. At length the lake was all but gone only a few of the deepest pools remaining unexhausted. It happened one day that a party of youngsters found themselves on the brink of one of these pools in the very centre of the lake. It was a rocky basin of considerable depth. Looking in, they saw at the bottom something that shone yellow in the sun. A little boy jumped in and dived for it. It was a plate of gold covered with writing. They carried it to the king. On one side of it stood these words, Death alone from death can save. Love is death, and so is brave. Love can fill the deepest grave. Love loves on beneath the wave. Now this was enigmatical enough to the king and courtiers, but the reverse of the plate explained it a little. Its writing amounted to this. If the lake should disappear, they must find the hole through which the water ran, but it would be useless to try to stop it by any ordinary means. There was but one effectual mode. The body of a living man could alone staunch the flow. The man must give himself of his own will, and the lake must take his life as it filled. Otherwise the offering would be of no avail. If the nation could not provide one hero, it was time it should perish. End of section 31 Recording by Jean Bascom, Potomac, Maryland Section 32 of Fairy Tales Every Child Should Know. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jean Bascom. Fairy Tales Every Child Should Know. Edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Section 32 The Light Princess by George MacDonald. Part 5. Chapter 13. Here I am. This was a very disheartening revelation to the king, not that he was unwilling to sacrifice a subject, but that he was hopeless of finding a man willing to sacrifice himself. No time was to be lost, however, for the princess was lying motionless on her bed, and taking no nourishment but lake water, which was now none of the best. Therefore the king caused the contents of the wonderful plate of gold to be published throughout the country. No one, however, came forward. 
the prince having gone several days journey into the forest to consult a hermit whom he had met there on his way to lago bell knew nothing of the oracle till his return when he had acquainted himself with all the particulars he sat down and thought she will die if i don't do it and life would be nothing to me without her so i shall lose nothing by doing it and life will be as pleasant to her as ever for she will soon forget me and there will be so much more beauty and happiness in the world to be sure i shall not see it here the poor prince gave a sigh how lovely the lake will be in the moonlight with that glorious creature sporting in it like a wild goddess it is rather hard to be drowned by inches though let me see that will be seventy inches of me to drown here he tried to laugh but could not the longer the better however he resumed for can i not bargain that the princess shall be beside me all the time so i shall see her once more kiss her perhaps who knows and die looking in her eyes it will be no death at least i shall not feel it and to see the lake filling for the beauty again all right i am ready he kissed the princess's boot laid it down and hurried to the king's apartment but feeling as he went that anything sentimental would be disagreeable he resolved to carry off the whole affair with nonchalance so he knocked at the door of the king's counting-house where it was all but a capital crime to disturb him when the king heard the knock he started up and opened the door in a rage seeing only the shoe-black he drew his sword this i am sorry to say was his usual mode of asserting his regality when he thought his dignity was in danger but the prince was not in the least alarmed please your majesty i'm your butler said he my butler you lying rascal what do you mean i mean i will cork your big bottle is the fellow mad bawled the king raising the point of his sword i will put the stopper plug what you call it in your leaky lake grand monarch said the prince the king was in such a rage that before he could speak he had time to cool and to reflect that it would be a great waste to kill the only man who was willing to be useful in the present emergency seeing that in the end the insolent fellow would be as dead as if he had died by his majesty's own hand oh he said at last putting up his sword with difficulty it was so long i am obliged to you you young fool take a glass of wine no thank you replied the prince very well said the king would you like to run and see your parents before you make your experiment no thank you said the prince then we will go and look for the hole at once said his majesty and proceeded to call some attendants stop please your majesty i have a condition to make interposed the prince what exclaimed the king a condition and with me how dare you as you please returned the prince coolly i wish your majesty a good morning you wretch i will have you put in a sack and stuck in the hole very well your majesty replied the prince becoming a little more respectful lest the wrath of the king should deprive him of the pleasure of dying for the princess but what good will that do your majesty please to remember that the oracle says the victim must offer himself well you have offered yourself retorted the king yes upon one condition condition again roared the king once more drawing his sword be gone somebody else will be glad enough to take the honour off your shoulders your majesty knows it will not be easy to get another to take my place well what is your condition growled the king feeling that the prince was right only this replied the prince that as i must on no account die before i am fairly drowned and the waiting will be rather wearisome the princess your daughter shall go with me feed me with her own hands and look at me now and then to comfort me for you must confess it is rather hard as soon as the water is up to my eyes she may go and be happy and forget her poor shoe-black here the prince's voice faltered and he very nearly grew sentimental in spite of his resolution why didn't you tell me before what your condition was such a fuss about nothing exclaimed the king do you grant it persisted the prince of course i do replied the king very well i am ready go and have some dinner then while i set my people to find the place the king ordered out his guards and gave directions to the officers to find the hole in the lake at once so the bed of the lake was marked out in divisions and thoroughly examined and in an hour or so the hole was discovered it was in the middle of a stone near the centre of the lake in the very pool where the golden plate had been found it was a three-cornered hole of no great size there was water all around the stone but very little was flowing through the hole chapter fourteen this is very kind of you the prince went to dress for the occasion for he was resolved to die like a prince 
when the princess heard that a man had offered to die for her she was so transported that she jumped off the bed feeble as she was and danced about the room for joy she did not care who the man was that was nothing to her the hole wanted stopping and if only a man would do it why take one in an hour or two more everything was ready her maid dressed her in haste and they carried her to the side of the lake when she saw it she shrieked and covered her face with her hands they bore her across to the stone where they had already placed a little boat for her the water was not deep enough to float in but they hoped it would be before long they laid her on cushions placed in the boat wines and fruits and other nice things and stretched a canopy over all in a few minutes the prince appeared the princess recognized him at once but did not think it worth while to acknowledge him here i am said the prince put me in they told me it was a shoe black said the princess so i am said the prince i blacked your little shoes three times a day because they were all i could get of you put me in the courtiers did not resent his bluntness except by saying to each other that he was taking it out in impudence but how was he to be put in the golden plate contained no instructions on this point the prince looked at the hole and saw but one way he put both his legs into it sitting on the stone and stooping forward covered the corner that remained open with his two hands in this uncomfortable position he resolved to abide his fate and turning to the people said now you can go the king had already gone home to dinner now you can go repeated the princess after him like a parrot the people obeyed her and went presently a little wave flowed over the stone and wetted one of the prince's knees but he did not mind it much he began to sing and the song he sang was this a world that has no well darkly bright in forest dell as a world without the gleam of the downward going stream as a world without the glance of the ocean's fair expanse as a world where never rain glittered on the sunny plain such my heart thy world would be if no love did flow in thee as a world without the sound of the rivulets underground or the bubbling of the spring out of darkness wandering or the mighty rush and flowing of the rivers downward going or the music showers that drop on the outspread beaches top or the ocean's mighty voice when his lifted waves rejoice such my soul thy world would be if no love did sing in thee lady keep thy world's delight keep the waters in thy sight love has made me strong to go for thy sake to realms below where the waters shine and hum through the darkness never come let i pray one thought of me spring a little well in thee lest thy loveless soul be found like a dry and thirsty ground sing it again prince it makes it less tedious said the princess but the prince was too much overcome to sing any more and a long pause followed this is very kind of you prince said the princess at last quite coolly as she lay in the boat with her eyes shut i am sorry i can't return the compliment thought the prince but you are worth dying for after all again a wavelet and another and another flowed over the stone and wetted both the prince's knees but he did not speak or move two three four hours passed in this way the princess apparently asleep and the prince very patient but he was much disappointed in his position for he had none of the consolation he had hoped for at last he could bear it no longer princess said he but at the moment up started the princess crying i'm afloat i'm afloat and the little boat bumped against the stone princess repeated the prince encouraged by seeing her wide awake and looking eagerly at the water well said she without looking round your papa promised that you should look at me and you haven't looked at me once did he then i suppose i must but i am so sleepy sleep then darling and don't mind me said the poor prince really you are very good replied the princess i think i will go to sleep again just give me a glass of wine and a biscuit first said the prince very humbly with all my heart said the princess and yawned as she said it she got the wine and the biscuit however and leaning over the side of the boat towards him was compelled to look at him why prince she said you don't look well are you sure you don't mind it not a bit answered he feeling very faint indeed only i shall die before it is of any use to you unless i have something to eat there then said she holding out the wine to him 
ah you must feed me i dare not move my hands the water would run away directly good gracious said the princess and she began at once to feed him with bits of biscuit and sips of wine as she fed him he contrived to kiss the tips of her fingers now and then she did not seem to mind it one way or the other but the prince felt better now for your own sake princess he said i cannot let you go to sleep you must sit and look at me else i shall not be able to keep up well i will do anything to oblige you answered she with condescension and sitting down she did look at him and kept looking at him with wonderful steadiness considering all things the sun went down and the moon rose and gush after gush the waters were rising up the prince's body they were up to his waist now why can't we go and have a swim said the princess there seems to be water enough just about here i shall never swim more said the prince oh i forgot said the princess and was silent so the water grew and grew and rose up and up on the prince and the princess sat and looked at him she fed him now and then the night wore on the waters rose and rose the moon rose likewise higher and higher and shone full on the face of the dying prince the water was up to his neck will you kiss me princess he said feebly the nonchalance was all gone now yes i will answered the princess and kissed him a long sweet cold kiss now said he with a sigh of content i die happy he did not speak again the princess gave him some wine for the last time he was past eating then she sat down again and looked at him the water rose and rose it touched his chin it touched his lower lip it touched between his lips he shut them hard to keep it out the princess began to feel strange it touched his upper lip he breathed through his nostrils the princess looked wild it covered his nostrils her eyes looked scared and shone strange in the moonlight his head fell back the water closed over it and the bubbles of his last breath bubbled up through the water the princess gave a shriek and sprang into the lake she laid hold first of one leg and then of the other and pulled and tugged but she could not move either she stopped to take breath and that made her think that he could not get any breath she was frantic she got hold of him and held his head above the water which was possible now that his hands were no longer on the hole but it was of no use for he was past breathing love and water brought back all her strength she got under the water and pulled and pulled with her whole might till at last she got one leg out the other easily followed how she got him into the boat she never could tell but when she did she fainted away coming to herself she seized the oars kept herself steady as best she could and rowed and rowed though she had never rowed before round rocks and over shallows and through mud she rowed till she got to the landing stairs of the palace by this time her people were on the shore for they had heard her shriek she made them carry the prince to her own room and lay him in her bed and light a fire and send for the doctors but the lake your highness said the chamberlain who roused by the noise came in in his nightcap go and drown yourself in it she said this was the last rudeness of which the princess was ever guilty and one must allow that she had good cause to feel provoked with the lord chamberlain had it been the king himself he would have fared no better but both he and the queen were fast asleep and the chamberlain went back to his bed somehow the doctors never came so the princess and her old nurse were left with the prince but the old nurse was a wise woman and knew what to do they tried everything for a long time without success the princess was nearly distracted between hope and fear but she tried on and on one thing after another and everything over and over again at last when they had all but given it up just as the sun rose the prince opened his eyes chapter fifteen look at the rain the princess burst into a passion of tears and fell on the floor there she lay for an hour and her tears never ceased all the pent-up crying of her life was spent now and a rain came on such as had never been seen in that country the sun shone all the time and the great drops which fell straight to the earth shone likewise the palace was in the heart of a rainbow it was a rain of rubies and sapphires and emeralds and topazes the torrents poured from the mountains like molten gold and if it had not been for its subterraneous outlet the lake would have overflowed and inundated the country it was full from shore to shore 
but the princess did not heed the lake she lay on the floor and wept and this rain within doors was far more wonderful than the rain out of doors for when it abated a little she proceeded to rise and found to her astonishment that she could not at length after many efforts she succeeded in getting upon her feet but she tumbled down again directly hearing her fall her old nurse uttered a yell of delight and ran to her screaming my darling child she's found her gravity oh that's it is it said the princess rubbing her shoulder and her knee alternately i consider it very unpleasant i feel as if i should be crushed to pieces hurrah cried the prince from the bed if you've come round princess so have i how's the lake brimful answered the nurse then we're all happy that we are indeed answered the princess sobbing and there was rejoicing all over the country that rainy day even the babies forgot their past troubles and danced and crowed amazingly and the king told stories and the queen listened to them and he divided the money in his box and she the honey in her pot among the children and there was such jubilation as was never heard of before of course the prince and princess were betrothed at once but the princess had to learn to walk before they could be married with any propriety and this was not so easy at her time of life for she could walk no more than a baby she was always falling down and hurting herself is this the gravity you used to make so much of said she one day to the prince as he raised her from the floor for my part i was a great deal more comfortable without it no no that's not it this is it replied the prince as he took her up and carried her about like a baby kissing her all the time this is gravity that's better she said i don't mind that so much and she smiled the sweetest loveliest smile in the prince's face and she gave him one little kiss in return for all his and he thought them overpaid for he was beside himself with delight i fear she complained of her gravity more than once after this notwithstanding it was quite a long time before she got reconciled to walking but the pain of learning it was quite counterbalanced by two things either of which would have been sufficient consolation the first was that the prince himself was her teacher and the second that she could tumble into the lake as often as she pleased still she preferred to have the prince jump in with her and the splash they made before was nothing to the splash they made now the lake never sank again in process of time it wore the roof of the cavern quite through and was twice as deep as before the only revenge the princess took upon her aunt was to tread pretty hard on her gouty toe the next time she saw her but she was sorry for it the very next day when she heard that the water had undermined her house and that it had fallen in the night burying her in its ruins whence no one ever ventured to dig up her body there she lies to this day so the prince and princess lived and were happy and had crowns of gold and clothes of cloth and shoes of leather and children of boys and girls not one of whom was ever known on the most critical occasion to lose the smallest atom of his or her due proportion of gravity end of section thirty two recording by jean bascom potomac maryland section thirty three of fairy tales every child should know this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lori Fuller, Chugiak, Alaska. Fairy Tales Every Child Should Know, edited by Hamilton Wright Mobby. Section 33, Beauty and the Beast, from the French tale by Madame Gabrielle de Villeneuve. There was once a very rich merchant who had six children three boys and three girls as he was himself a man of great sense he spared no expense for their education but provided them with all sorts of masters for their improvement the three daughters were all handsome but particularly the youngest indeed she was so very beautiful that in her childhood every one called her the little beauty and being still the same when she was grown up nobody called her by any other name which made her sisters very jealous of her. This youngest daughter was not only more handsome than her sisters, but was also better tempered. The two eldest were vain of being rich, and spoke with pride to those they thought below them. They gave themselves a thousand airs, and would not visit other merchants' daughters, nor would they indeed be seen with any but persons of quality. They went every day to balls, plays, and public walks, and always made 
game of their youngest sister for spending her time in reading or other useful employments. As it was well known that these young ladies would have large fortunes, many great merchants wished to get them for their wives, but the two eldest always answered that, for their parts, they had no thoughts of marrying any one below a duke or an earl at least. Beauty had quite as many offers as her sisters, but she always answered with the greatest civility that she was much obliged to her lovers, but would rather live some years longer with her father, as she thought herself too young to marry. It happened that by some unlucky accident the merchant suddenly lost all his fortune, and had nothing left but a small cottage in the country. Upon this he said to his daughters, while the tears ran down his cheeks all the time, "'My children, we must now go and dwell in the cottage and try to get a living by labor, for we have no other means of support. The two eldest replied that, for their parts, they did not know how to work, and would not leave town, for they had lovers enough who would be glad to marry them, though they had no longer any fortune. But in this they were mistaken, for when the lovers heard what had happened, they said, The girls were so proud and ill-tempered that all we wanted was their fortune. We are not sorry at all to see their pride brought down. Let them give themselves heirs to their cows and sheep. But everybody pitied poor Beauty, because she was so sweet-tempered and kind to all that knew her, and several gentlemen offered to marry her, though she had not a penny. But Beauty still refused, and said she could not think of leaving her poor father in this trouble, and would go and help him in his labors in the country. At first Beauty could not help sometimes crying in secret for the hardships she was now obliged to suffer, but in a very short time she said to herself, "'All the crying in the world will do me no good,' so I will try to be happy without a fortune. When they had removed to their cottage, the merchant and his three sons employed themselves in plowing and sowing the fields, and working in the garden. Beauty also did her part, for she got up by four o'clock every morning, lighted the fires, cleaned the house, and got the breakfast for the whole family. At first she found all this very hard, and thought it no hardship at all, and indeed the work greatly amended her health. When she had done, she used to amuse herself with reading, playing on her music, or singing while she spun. But her two sisters were at a loss what to do to pass the time away. They had their breakfast in bed, and did not rise till ten o'clock. Then they commonly walked out, but always found themselves very soon tired, when they would often sit down under a shady tree, and grieve for the loss of their carriage and fine clothes, and say to each other, what a mean-spirited, poor, stupid creature our young sister is, to be so content with our low way of life. But their father thought in quite another way. He admired the patience of his sweet young creature, for her sisters not only left her to do the whole work of the house, but made game of her every moment. After they had lived in this manner about a year, the merchant received a letter, which informed him that one of the richest ships, which he thought was lost, had just come into port. This news made the two eldest sisters almost mad with joy, for they thought they should now leave the cottage and have all their finery again. When they found that their father must take a journey to the ship, the two eldest begged he would not fail to bring them back some new gowns, caps, rings, and all sorts of trinkets. But Beauty asked for nothing, for she thought in herself that all the ship was worth would hardly buy everything her sisters wished for. Beauty, said the merchant, how comes it about that you ask for nothing? What can I bring you, my child? Since you are so kind as to think of me, dear father, she answered, I should be glad if you would bring me a rose, for we have none in our garden. Now Beauty did not indeed wish for a rose, nor anything else, but she only said this, that she might not affront her sisters, for else they would have said she wanted her father to praise her for not asking him for anything. The merchant took his leave of them, and set out on his journey. But when he got to the ship, some persons went to law with him about the cargo, and after a deal of trouble, he came back to his cottage as poor as he had gone away. When he was within thirty miles of his home, and thinking of the joy he should in again meeting his children, and he quite lost himself. It rained and snowed very hard, and besides, the wind was so high as to throw him twice from his horse. Night came on, and he thought to be sure he should die of cold and hunger, or to be torn to pieces by the wolves that he heard howling around him. 
All at once he now cast his eyes toward a long row of trees, and saw a light at the end of them, but it seemed a great way off. He made the best of his way towards it, and found that it came from a fine palace lighted all over. He walked faster, and soon reached the gates, which he opened, and was very much surprised that he did not see a single person or creature in any of the yards. His horse had followed him, and finding a stable with the door open, went into it at once, and here the poor beast, being nearly starved, helped himself to a good meal of oats and hay. His master then tied him up, and walked toward the house, which he entered, but still without seeing a living creature. He went on to a large hall, where he found a good fire, and a table covered with some very nice dishes, and only one plate with a knife and fork. As the snow and rain had wetted him to the skin, he went up to the fire to dry himself. "'I hope,' said he, "'the master of the house or his servants will excuse me, for to be sure it will not be long now before I see them.' He waited a good time, but still nobody came. At last the clock struck eleven, and the merchant, feeling quite faint for the want of food, helped himself to a chicken, which he made but two mouthfuls of, and then to a few glasses of wine, yet all the time trembling with fear. He sat till the clock struck twelve, but did not see a single creature. He now took courage, and began to think of looking a little more about him. So he opened a door at the end of the hall, and went through it to a very grand room, in which there was a fine bed, and as he was quite weak and tired, he shut the door, took off his clothes, and got into it. It was ten o'clock in the morning before he thought of getting up, when he was amazed to see a handsome new suit of clothes laid ready for him, instead of his own, which he had spoiled. "'To be sure,' said he to himself, "'this place belongs to some good fairy, who has taken pity on my ill luck. He looked out of the window, and instead of snow he saw the most charming arbors covered with all kinds of flowers. He returned to the hall where he had supped, and found a breakfast table, with some chocolate, got ready for him. "'Indeed, my good fairy,' said the merchant aloud, "'I am vastly obliged to you for your kind care of me.' He then made a hearty breakfast, took his hat, and was going to the stable to pay his horse a visit. But as he passed under one of the arbors, which was loaded with roses, he thought of what beauty had asked him to bring back to her, and so he took a bunch of roses to carry home. At the same moment he heard a most shocking noise, and saw such a frightful beast coming towards him that he was ready to drop with fear. "'Ungrateful man!' said the beast in a terrible voice. "'I have saved your life by letting you into my palace, "'and in return you steal my roses, "'which I value more than anything else that belongs to me. "'But you shall make amends for your fault with your life. "'You shall die in a quarter of an hour.' "'The merchant fell on his knees to the beast, "'and clasping his hand said, "'My lord, I humbly beg your pardon. "'I did not think it would offend you "'to gather a rose for one of my daughters "'who wished to have one.' "'I am not a lord, but a beast,' replied the monster. "'I do not like false compliments, but that people should say what they think. "'So do not fancy that you can coax me by any such ways. "'You tell me that you have daughters. "'Now I will pardon you, if one of them will agree to come and die instead of you. "'Go, and if your daughter should refuse, promise me that you yourself will return in three months.' "'The tender-hearted merchant had no thought of letting any one of his daughters die instead of him.' but he knew that if he seemed to accept the beast's terms, he should at least have the pleasure of seeing them once again. So he gave the beast his promise, and the beast told him that he might set off as soon as he liked. But, said the beast, I do not wish you to go back empty-handed. Go to the room you slept in, and you will find a chest there. Fill it with just what you like best, and I will get it taken to your house for you. When the beast had said this, he went away, and the good merchant said to himself, if I must die, yet I shall now have the comfort of leaving my children some riches. He returned to the room he had slept in, and found a great many pieces of gold. He filled the chest with them to the very brim, locked it, and mounting his horse, left the palace as sorry as he had been when he first found it. The horse took a path across the forest of his own accord, and in a few hours they reached the merchant's house. His children came running around him as he got off his horse. But the merchant, instead of kissing them with joy, could not help crying as he looked at them. He held in his hand the bunch of roses, which he gave to Beauty, saying, Take these roses, Beauty, 
but little do you think how dear they have cost your poor father. And then he gave them an account of all that he had seen or heard in the palace of the beast. The two eldest sisters now began to shed tears and to lay the blame upon Beauty, who they said would be the cause of her father's death. See, said they, what happens from the pride of the little wretch. Why did she not ask for fine things as we did? But, to be sure, Miss must not be like other people, and though she will be the cause of her father's death, yet she does not shed a tear. It would be of no use, replied Beauty, to weep for the death of my father, for he shall not die now. As the beast will accept one of his daughters, I will give myself up to him, and think myself happy in being able at once to save his life and prove my love for the best of daughters. No, sister, said the three brothers, you shall not die. We will go and search for this monster, and either he or we will perish. Do not hope to kill him, said the merchant, for his power is far too great for you to be able to do any such thing. I am charmed with the kindness of beauty, but I will not suffer her life to be lost. I myself am old and cannot expect to live much longer, so I shall but give up a few years of my life and shall only grieve for the sake of my children. Never, father, cried beauty, shall you go to the palace without me, for you cannot hinder my going after you. Though I am young, I am not over fond of life, and I would much rather be eaten up by the monster than die of the grief your loss would give me. The merchant tried in vain to reason with Beauty, for she would go, which, in truth, made her two sisters glad, for they were jealous of her, because everybody loved her. The merchant was so grieved at the thoughts of losing his child that he never once thought of the chest filled with gold, but at night, to his great surprise, he found it standing by his bedside. He said nothing about his riches to his eldest daughters for he knew very well it would at once make them want to return to town. But he told Beauty his secret, and she then said that while he was away, two gentlemen had been on a visit to their cottage, who had fallen in love with her two sisters. She then begged her father to marry them without delay, for she was so sweet-tempered that she loved them for all they had used her so ill, and forgave them with all her heart. When the three months were past, the merchant and Beauty got ready to set out for the palace of the beast. Upon this, the two sisters rubbed their eyes with an onion to make believe they shed a great many tears. But both the merchant and his sons cried in earnest. There was only Beauty who did not, for she thought that this would only make the matter worse. They reached the palace in a very few hours, and the horse, without bidding, went into the same stable as before. The merchant and Beauty walked towards the large hall, where they found a table covered with every dainty, and two plates laid ready. The merchant had very little appetite, but Beauty, that she might the better hide her grief, placed herself at the table and helped her father. She then began herself to eat, and thought all the time that to be sure the beast had a mind to fatten her before he ate her up, as he had got such good cheer for her. When they had done their supper, they heard a great noise, and the good old man began to bid his poor child farewell, for he knew it was the beast coming to them. When Beauty first saw his frightful form, she could not help being afraid, but she tried to hide her fear as much as she could. The beast asked her if she had come quite of her own accord, and though she was now still more afraid than before, she made shift to say, Yes. You are a good girl, and I think myself very much obliged to you. He then turned toward her father and said to him, Good man, you may leave the palace tomorrow morning, and take care never to come back to it again. Good night, beauty. Good night, beast, said she. And then the monster went out of the room. Ah, my dear child, said the merchant, kissing his daughter, I am half dead already at the thoughts of leaving you with this dreadful beast. You had better go back and let me stay in your place. No, said Beauty boldly, I will never agree to that. You must go home tomorrow morning. They then wished each other good night and went to bed, both of them thinking they should not be able to close their eyes. But as soon as ever they had laid down, they fell into a deep sleep and did not wake till morning. Beauty dreamed that a lady came up to her who said, 
I am very much pleased, Beauty, with the goodness you have shown in being willing to give your life to save that of your father, and it shall not go without a reward. As soon as Beauty awoke, she told her father this dream, but though it gave him some comfort, he could not take leave of his darling child without shedding many tears. When the merchant got out of sight, Beauty sat down in the large hall and began to cry also, yet she had a great deal of courage, and so she soon resolved not to make her sad case still worse by sorrow, which she knew could not be of any use to her, but to wait as well as she could till night, when she thought the beast would not fail to come and eat her up. She walked about to take a view of all the palace, and the beauty of every part of it much charmed her. But what was her surprise, when she came to a door on which was written, Beauty's Room? She opened it in haste, and her eyes were all at once dazzled at the grandeur of the inside of the room. What made her wonder more than all the rest was a large library filled with books, a harpsichord, and many other pieces of music. The beast takes care I shall not be at a loss how to amuse myself, said she. She then thought that it was not likely such things would have been got ready for her if she had but one day to live, and began to hope all would not turn out so bad as she and her father had feared. She opened the library and saw these verses written in letters of gold on the back of one of the books. Beauteous lady, dry your tears. There's no cause for sighs or fears. Command as freely as you may. Enjoyment still shall mark your sway. Alas, said she, sighing, there is nothing I so much desire as to see my poor father and to know what he is doing at this moment. She said this to herself, but just then by chance she cast her eyes on a looking-glass that stood near her, and in the glass she saw her home and her father riding up to the cottage in the deepest sorrow. Her sisters came out to meet him, but for all they tried to look sorry, it was easy to see that in their hearts they were very glad. In a short time all this picture went away out of the glass, but Beauty began to think that the beast was very kind to her, and that she had no need to be afraid of him. About the middle of the day she found a table laid ready for her, and a sweet concert of music played all the time she was eating her dinner without her seeing a single creature. But at supper, when she was going to seat herself at table, she heard the noise of the beast, and could not help trembling with fear. "'Beauty,' said he, "'will you give me leave to see you sup?' "'That is as you please,' answered she, very much afraid. "'Not in the least,' said the beast. "'You alone command in this place. "'If you should not like my company, you need only to say so, "'and I will leave you that moment. "'But tell me, Beauty,' "'Do you not think me very ugly?' "'Why, yes,' said she, "'for I cannot tell a story. "'But then I think you are very good. "'You are right,' replied the beast. "'And besides being ugly, I am also very stupid. "'I know very well enough that I am but a beast.' "'I should think you cannot be very stupid,' said Beauty, "'if you yourself know this. "'Pray do not let me hinder you from eating,' said he. "'And be sure you do not want for anything.' "'for all you see is yours, and I shall be vastly grieved if you are not happy.' "'You are very kind,' said Beauty. "'I must needs own that I think very well of your good nature, "'and then I almost forget how ugly you are.' "'Yes, yes, I hope I am good-tempered,' said he. "'But still, I am a monster.' "'There are many men who are worse monsters than you are,' replied Beauty. "'And I am better pleased with you in that form, though it is so ugly.' than with those who carry wicked hearts under the form of a man. If I had any sense, said the beast, I would thank you for what you have said, but I am too stupid to say anything that would give you pleasure. Beauty ate her supper with a very good appetite, and almost lost all her dread of the monster, but she was ready to sink with fright when he said to her, Beauty, will you be my wife? For a few minutes she was not able to speak a word, for she was afraid of putting him in a passion by refusing. At length she said, "'No, beast.' The beast made no reply, but sighed deeply and went away. When Beauty found herself alone, she began to feel pity for the poor beast. "'Dear,' said she, "'what a sad thing it is that he should be so very frightful, since he is so good-tempered.' 
Beauty lived three months in this palace, very well pleased. The beast came to see her every night, and talked with her while she supped, and though what he said was not very clever, yet as she saw in him every day some new mark of his goodness. So instead of dreading the time of his coming, she was always looking at her watch, to see if it was almost nine o'clock, for that was the time when he never failed to visit her. There was but one thing that vexed her, which was that every night before the beast went away from her, he always made it a rule to ask her if she would be his wife, and seemed very much grieved at her saying no. At last one night she said to him, "'You vex me greatly, beast, by forcing me to refuse you so often. I wish I could take such a liking to you as to agree to marry you, but I must tell you plainly that I do not think it will ever happen. I shall always be your friend, so try to let that make you easy.' "'I must needs do so, then,' said the beast, "'for I know well enough how frightful I am, "'but I love you better than myself. "'Yet I think I am very lucky "'in your being pleased to stay with me. "'Now promise me, Beauty, that you will never leave me.' "'Beauty was quite struck when he said this, "'for that very day she had seen in her glass "'that her father had fallen sick of grief for her sake "'and was very ill for the want of seeing her again.' "'I would promise you with all my heart,' said she, "'never to leave you quite, but I long so much to see my father, "'that if you do not give me leave to visit him, I shall die with grief.' "'I would rather die myself, Beauty,' answered the beast, "'than make you fret. I will send you to your father's cottage. "'You shall stay there, and your poor beast shall die of sorrow.' "'No,' said Beauty, crying, "'I love you too well to be the cause of your death. "'I promise to return in a week.' You have shown me that my sisters are married, and my brothers are gone for soldiers, so that my father is left all alone. Let me stay a week with him. You shall find yourself with him to-morrow morning, replied the beast. But mind, do not forget your promise. When you wish to return, you have nothing to do but to put your ring on a table when you go to bed. Good-bye, Beauty. The beast then sighed as he said these words, and Beauty went to bed, very sorry to see him so much grieved. When she awoke in the morning, she found herself in her father's cottage. She rung a bell that was at her bedside, and a servant entered. But as soon as she saw Beauty, the woman gave a loud shriek, upon which the merchant ran upstairs. And when he beheld his daughter, he was ready to die of joy. He ran to the bedside and kissed her a hundred times. At last Beauty began to remember that she had brought no clothes with her to put on. "'but the servant told her she had just found in the next room "'a large chest full of dresses trimmed all over with gold "'and adorned with pearls and diamonds. "'Beauty, in her own mind, thanked the beast for his kindness "'and put on the plainest gown she could find among them all. "'She then told the servant to put the rest away with a great deal of care, "'for she intended to give them to her sisters. "'But as soon as she had spoken these words, "'the chest was gone out of sight in a moment. "'Her father then said, Perhaps the beast chose for her to keep them all for herself, and as soon as he had said this, they saw the chest standing again in the same place. While Beauty was dressing herself, a servant brought word to her that her sisters were come with their husbands to pay her a visit. They both lived unhappily with the gentleman they had married. The husband of the eldest was very handsome, but was so very proud of this that he thought of nothing else from morning till night and did not attend to the beauty of his wife. The second had married a man of great learning, but he made no use of it, only to torment and affront all his friends and his wife more than any of them. The two sisters were ready to burst with spite when they saw Beauty dressed like a princess, and looked so very charming. All the kindness that she showed them was of no use, for they were vexed more than ever when she told them how happy she lived at the palace of the beast. The spiteful creatures went by themselves into the garden, where they cried to think of her good fortune. "'Why should the little wretch be better off than we?' said they. "'We are much handsomer than she is. "'Sister,' said the eldest, "'a thought has just come into my head. "'Let us try to keep her here longer than the week that the beast gave her leave for. "'And then he will be so angry that perhaps he will eat her up in a moment.' "'That is well thought of,' answered the other. "'But to do this we must seem very kind to her.' They then made up their minds to be so, and went to join her in the cottage, where they showed her so much false love that Beauty could not help crying for joy. 
When the week was ended, the two sisters began to pretend so much grief at the thoughts of her leaving them that she agreed to stay a week more. But all that time Beauty could not help fretting for the sorrow that she knew her staying would give her poor beast, for she tenderly loved him and much wished for his company again. The tenth night of her being at the cottage she dreamed she was in the garden of the palace, and that the beast lay dying on a grass plot, and with his last breath put her in mind of her promise, and laid his death to her keeping away from him. Beauty awoke in a great fright and burst into tears. "'Am not I wicked,' said she, "'to behave so ill to a beast who has shown me so much kindness? Why will I not marry him?' I am sure I should be more happy with him than my sisters are with their husbands. He shall not be wretched any longer on my account, for I should do nothing but blame myself all the rest of my life. She then rose, put her ring on the table, got into bed again, and soon fell asleep. In the morning, she, with joy, found herself in the palace of the beast. She dressed herself very finely, that she might please him the better, and thought she had never known a day pass away so slow. At last the clock struck nine, but the beast did not come. Beauty then thought to be sure she had been the cause of his death in earnest. She ran from room to room all over the palace, calling out his name, but still she saw nothing of him. After looking for him a long time, she thought of her dream, and ran directly towards the grass plot, and there she found the poor beast lying senseless and seeming dead. She threw herself upon his body, thinking nothing at all of his ugliness, and finding his heart still beat, she ran and fetched some water from a pond in the garden, and threw it on his face. The beast then opened his eyes and said, "'You have forgot your promise, beauty.' My grief for the loss of you has made me resolve to starve myself to death. But I shall die content, since I have had the pleasure of seeing you once more. No, dear beast, replied Beauty, you shall not die. You shall live to be my husband from this moment I offer to marry you, and will be only yours. Oh, I thought I felt only friendship for you, but the pain I now feel shows me that I could not live without seeing you. The moment Beauty had spoken these words, the palace was suddenly lighted up, and music, fireworks, and all kinds of rejoicings appeared around about them. Yet Beauty took no notice of all this, but watched over her dear beast with the greatest tenderness. But now she was all at once amazed to see at her feet, instead of her poor beast, the handsomest prince that ever was seen, who thanked her most warmly for having broken his enchantment. Though this young prince deserved all her notice, she could not help asking him what was become of the beast. "'You see him at your feet, beauty,' answered the prince, "'for I am he. A wicked fairy had condemned me to keep the form of a beast till a beautiful young lady should agree to marry me, and ordered me, on pain of death, not to show that I had any sense. You alone, dearest beauty, have kindly judged of me by the goodness of my heart.' and in return I offer you my hand and my crown, though I know the reward is much less than what I owe you. Beauty, in the most pleasing surprise, helped the prince to rise, and they walked along to the palace, when her wonder was very great to find her father and sisters there, who had been brought by the lady Beauty had seen in her dream. Beauty, said the lady, for she was a fairy, receive the reward of the choice you have made, you have chosen goodness of heart rather than sense and beauty. Therefore you deserve to find them all three joined in the same person. You are going to be a great queen. I hope a crown will not destroy your future. As for you, ladies, said the fairy to the other two sisters, I have long known the malice of your hearts and the wrongs you have done. You shall become two statues, but under that form you shall still keep your reason and shall be fixed at the gates of your sister's palace, and I will not pass any worse sentence on you than to see her happy. You will never appear in your own persons again till you are fully cured of your faults, and to tell the truth, I am very much afraid you will remain statues for ever. At the same moment the fairy, with a stroke of her wand, removed all who were present to the young prince's country, where he was received with the greatest joy by his subjects, he married Beauty, and passed a long and happy life with her. 
because they still kept in the same course of goodness from which they had never departed. End of section 33. Recording by Lori Fuller, Chugiak, Alaska. End of Fairy Tales Every Child Should Know. Edited by Hamilton Wright, Mobby.